Okay, I have a problem. What's your problem, John? There comes a point in, I feel like, everyone's life where you have to make like a really crucial decision. And you guys probably know what I'm talking about. No. Crips or Bloods? Okay, first we're white. <laughs> I, I don't think that much. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I stopped myself there and I thought about it and I was like, you know what? Maybe it kind of matters. But look, my point is, I made a discovery recently that's kind of shook things up for me a lot. So, okay, I'm like 11 years old and I hear these gangs, the Crips and the Bloods, and I know I have to take a side because what if like I ever, what if, what if shit ever kicks off, you know? And so I'm like, well, I'll pick the Crypts. Why? Because they're called Crypts and that's spooky. And I know I'm a little bit spooky. And so I'd kind of get along better in that gang. You Wait, know? like Crypt is in like, like a tomb? Yes. That's not well. I know that now. I found out last week, and now I don't know what to fucking do because, like, now the whole reason I sided with them in the first place is just fucking it's not real. And, like, what if I get talking to them now and they're like, Why did you join? Like, I'm not hang on, wait. I'm sure they'll miss you. The you, 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 usually the way you pick what side you want is you pick which rapper kind of picked. So like, so you pick the one your favorite rapper picked. For example, Snoop Dogg uh, would rap at a lot of uh, Crip gatherings okay, in which, the early nineties. Which did Weird Al side with? <laughs> <laughs> Let me Google Weird Al and Crip Trip. <laughs> I'd say maybe the Bloods. You think so? Yeah. <laughs> Runs through all our veins. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's his angle. Okay. What about John Cena? We're all Gaelic folk. That's us. Gaelic folk here. Uh, the word Gaelic is never used in Ireland. Yeah, never. never, never ever, not ever, once. Ever. So don't... Just say you speak Irish, don't, not Gaelic. Don't ever say Gaelic to an if, Irish person. If someone said to me, do you speak Gaelic, I would not know what they're talking about. <laughs> I'd be like, I'd be like, your mom speaks Gaelic. <laughs> Just right. kinda... I'm pretty good at a Gaelic. <laughs> 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 I like how you like swung your fucking arms. I needed to make halfway it. through that fucking sentence. I was like, "She's not," <laughs> and then, yeah, she went there. Yep, she sure did. She took a photo. It wasn't a good photo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she was there. Welcome to Let's Fight a Boss, the world's strongest video game podcast i am sitting here with your newly crowned queens of the podcast it's brian hey uh I, i'm more of a co-queen i i am i'm just going with the flow and neve second year in a row you're really bad at this game and with you always i'm your fallen prince of this for the boss cast those who languish in the shadow john People were asking me, am I like, how do I feel about, I think this is actually the third year in a row. <laughs> You're super bad, okay. People were asking me how I feel about third year in the row not being the queen. And Wait, what, would, would I, you be the queen or the king? A queen, it's a queen, queen of the podcast. It's not king of the podcast. That yeah. is the most gendered fucking, oh my god. When we started doing it three years ago, you kept using the K words and now. Yeah, well I'm more progressive now. Okay, well, I guess we're all the Q word now. People are asking me how I feel about it, and what I would say is the kind of same thing I say every time. I blame the fans. Uh, I blame the listeners of this podcast. I've always been very like outspoken in kind of my criticisms towards our fan base. I don't have a lot of good things to say, and uh, they're the worst, and they give you both your powers, and it's not like I blame you two, because it's, like it's, like it's like a frog in the scorpion kind of thing. Do you know, do you know that story? I do? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Being what you are is just in your nature and you two cannot help it. But it's the fans who give you that power that I have the real problem with. 
this is all on you. Like, I don't know why you're, like, blaming someone that has nothing to do with it. Like, the fans are just listening to this going, like, what the fuck is this problem? No, I can hear them, la- I can hear them laughing. I see their comments. They're the worst. They're supportive and they're great. And you would know that if you could answer a question right. And you know those, you know those, <laughs> you know those, those fans who are all there. You do get the occasional ones who are like, I support the Fallen Prince, John. They're the worst of all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the fuck hell are you dying on <laughs> oh my god guys i watched fire festival or just fire uh, this is fire the greatest party that never happened the yes. netflix documentary yeah. did all three of us watch this yes. yes not to be confused with the hulu documentary that is out in a week. Which, <laughs> no, it was it? They released it the day before Netflix released theirs. Oh, so the Hulu one's out. Yeah. Oh. And that's oh. called Fire F- uh, Frauded. Okay, maybe I'll watch that that's next, a way worse and I can name. compare and contrast. Apparently, the Hulu one, you know, Billy. Yeah. The Hulu one has Billy like proper in it. Mm-hmm. Wow. Billy is like the main guy. They besides, paid for bes- an interview. Besides Jaru. Yeah. Um. I think it's really interesting when like a documentary tries to kind of make one of the subjects the antagonist and you're kind of like that's really manipulative well but then the netflix one was made by the marketing or it was directed by the marketing team behind fire (laughs) so all those guys in it who were just like it was all billy i mean we were just like doing the marketing because those marketing guys were putting up photos that was like four days to go so you'd be dancing on the beach they're like clearly not our fault they're the producers of and the word, word has word has gotten around since that like they did know what was happening. Oh, totally. They, I'm sure not they everyone to. on the marketing team knew, mm-hmm. but fucking someone did. The main guy did. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, at Fire Festival, I'm sure everyone knows about it. It was this massive social media fucking disaster, where it was this big influencer festival where they got all the biggest influencers. Didn't get us. No. So straight away. A big hole in their story right there. Because I really would have liked to have gone to it. Yeah, me too. I really would have. Our bikini bodies were ready. We wanted to play with some pigs. That's true. Yeah. Wait. There was pigs on the island. Oh. Yeah. I shaved my shoulders and everything. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> it just turned into this horrific social media shit show where it, where people had paid thousands of dollars to go to this big expensive festival and they showed up to like basically a shanty town made out of tents it 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 was kind of very ironic that it was these privileged rich americans living in what resembles a refugee camp and i think that 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 was the big hook of the of the shit show on social media i think the yeah. tents that were used were left over from hurricane katrina yeah Seemingly. Not Hurricane Katrina, but no, a different one. A, a a similar hurricane, sure. From from uh, a pre from from a different year of that season. Yeah. Um, I think there was when Fire Festival went to shit. Was it last year this happened? This was uh, was... this was April in two thousand seventeen. Okay, when that all went to shit, there was just such glee online because it was just a whole pile of rich kids <laughs> being really upset that there they were, were there were some normal folk who had spent like savings on it and yeah it feels super fucking bad for them but even the, like they got this one like rich kid on the documentary and he was like we didn't want anyone around our tent so we started stabbing holes in the tents and peeing on them and i was that like is what is so crazy isn't it it's just like why would you do that it's like they were barely there a few hours and everything just went into like hysteric craziness i, don't know. I remember one time <laughs> we worked with a a rich little boy, we'll call him. Yeah. And the longer we worked with him, the more we began to realize what a psychopath he was. Maybe it just kind of that level of money makes you a psychopath. I think I think it's more you just you're think raised you're... to be like, now son, normal people, they don't matter. Other people, they don't matter. Yeah, you're probably raised like you're immortal and you just have like a quadruple safety net that you're just you're never gonna die mm. and that other people are just there to serve you yeah. that was the big weird thing but um that's still a fun part of the fire documentary as well <laughs> i, there was I like the chaos part and it was really bad the evian bit yes where 
basically Billy phones up this other guy. This like senior business VP who had done all this other shit and had an established career. Over 30 years. And he's like, I need you to take a hit for the team. And his logic is basically like, you're gay. I need you to go and suck this guy's dick so we can get water to fire festival. And that was real just dark heart of humanity kind of shit. That was that was bleak. Take one for the team, suck a dick. I I've been running this over in my head cuz I don't want to make any like assumptions or anything, but I'm not quite sure like why the why was the fact that he was gay advantageous to that situation? I don't know cuz was the other guy gay? I don't think so. Exactly. So Billy could have slapped a dick. But my only thought is maybe the gay guy could have been better at it. But then how would that make a difference? Because if the guy's like, okay, suck my dick and I'll get you the wall. He won't know your ability <laughs> level and then he's locked in. So I don't may, know. May, maybe, maybe this guy and the other guy had a flirtatious history or something like that. Maybe. Like may, maybe, may, maybe there's a bigger story that. This was the import just, guy. So maybe yeah. he dealt with him before. And this was to circumvent import, import charges for tree, tree, tree <laughs> trucks of Evian water to get to the camp. Should have been Fiji. Uh, one of my favorite bits in it is the uh, pilot that brought them there who taught himself on Microsoft uh, that Flight really Simulator. Good. That was really, really good. But he was also the only guy with his head screwed on because he was like, you can't have these tents in this sun without like plumbing and air conditioning. And they were just like, you can go now. <laughs> <laughs> Like, people were pointing out issues and they were like, instead of hearing them, they were just like, I don't like what you're saying, so you should leave. And there was that yoga guy who had, like, sent this big long email about, like, we're fucked. Like, we're gonna die. This is not gonna work. And he just gets back an email that says, well, at least your smiling face will be able to teach some yoga. It's so nuts. Like, did they actually think they could just pull it off or what What would happen? Like, Yes, that's exactly what they thought. But even at the last minute, even as people were arriving... I just think this guy was so good at lying that he had lied to himself and he had just... Here's the thing about this guy. turned off everything. I think this guy is probably a brilliant businessman. But brilliant businessmen are psychopaths and he just got in the wrong business. I bet there are so many guys like this that are like very successful in business because they never get into a situation where their insanity is exposed. See, it's like, I don't even think he was good at business. He was good at selling an idea for a business. Sure. Because he didn't make a business. No, no, no. (laughs) But like exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. I can't believe how much of the pre-production of this was documented. Yeah. All the behind the scenes footage. But then even after the Fire Festival, when it's his second project with The Hustle, and all of that is documented. Why would you film yourself committing a crime? Yeah. And use the word hustle. And why would you like film yourself and everyone in the room talking about how what you're doing isn't fraud? <laughs> like, because oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that's so weird. So this dude is twenty seven. He's twenty seven? Yeah. Okay, he looked in his thirties. I I think that's all the uh the partying he's done. I liked that he got on bail out of jail and then immediately proceeded to commit the exact same crime. <laughs> just no comma, no punctuation, just straight out the door, fucking fraud all over again. Uh, it's a it's a good documentary. I had a great time with it. It's very fun. Yeah. Um, I've been checking out something else on Netflix. Trigger warning with Killer Mike. What is this? <laughs> This show was a really nice surprise. Um, I saw the trailer for it, and I saw I saw the name of it, like Trigger Warning, and I thought it was gonna be just just edgy humor, like kind of like Bora or whatever. And this was not that. This was much closer to say a Nathan for you, except it dealt with a lot of like. I guess racial and political issues and was kind of making fun of them but also in a weird way trying to make points about them and I'm not saying the points were always successful but I guess the host Killer Mike who's like this rapper 
I always had the genuine sense that he was really actually trying to reach people and change people's minds. And he threw himself in there as well. I, yeah. I watched two episodes with John and he's he, he's a really, really cool guy. Like, I there's like parts where, like, um, he confronts people about being racist. But when he does, I felt like his objective, was, he wasn't trying to be funny. He wasn't trying to, like be angry he was genuinely trying to change their minds and it was it like and like it was funny because some of these people were ridiculous but he was trying so it's like not script he's talking to real people yeah. like okay and at the start i thought like oh this guy is taking the piss this guy is like he's he's having a laugh i by the end of it i wasn't so sure anymore and that kind of that kind of genuineness, it, it kind of, I, I think it kind of gave the show a bit of heart that I wasn't expecting. Now that said, it still has some absolutely fucking ridiculous shit in it. Like there's a bit where he tries to form a, like a pop group out of a bunch of musicians from like really divergent social groups. So one of them's like a, a Jewish Renaissance performer. Another one is a, a a like black feminist lady another one is a juggalo and another one is like a white nationalist who is just such a fucking piece of shit and yep <laughs> it was like it was as problematic and as awkward as you think it's going to be but it was very entertaining and this show is a real surprise to me it's six episodes it's on netflix um I really enjoyed it, and I really hope they make more of it because I th I think this was like Brian, you you said to me like it's really f like kind of fresh feeling, and that's what I thought about it. Like I've never really seen something like this before. Yeah, um, it definitely takes a page out of Nathan for you, but I could see it becoming its own thing. And like it does deal with like real issues. Yeah, it does, and I'm still thinking about them. Yeah, so me too. maybe that's what's kind of good. Like it doesn't feel disposable. Yeah. Like, um, there's one of these, there's, there's an episode where he wants to make, this is where my realization came from earlier. He wants to make Crip a cola. He wants to take the gang of Crips and brand them as a cola. And it's like, well, why the fuck are you doing that? And he's like, well, Hell's Angels are a white gang that do exactly as much shit as the Crips. And they have their own merchandise. They have their own fan clubs. They have all this kind of stuff. And they're like, they've made a legitimate merchandising business. Why should they get to make that and the Crips don't? And so it's kind of like, it's this fucking, it's this such a stupid idea. But then it's like, oh, yeah, I I, I guess you're right. Yeah, the logic is and sound. It, yeah, it's like, there's loads of stuff like that in it. And it, it's, it's just, it's funny and it's entertaining and like, it is insightful. Now maybe it's like, it's less insightful if you're kind of more familiar with racial studies and stuff like that. And you're not a complete fucking dumb dumb like I am. But it did. You love it when I say that, don't you, Brian? Dumb, dumb. <laughs> but like, it, it, yeah, it's. I, I, I thought it was compelling. At the end of the day, is it next Netflix funded? I think it's a Netflix original. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. No. I, I, I really, really like Killer Mike. Killer Mike is a charismatic, charming man. Yeah. It's a part where he performs in front of a mostly white nursing home, and he performs the song "Kill Your Masters," and it's. Then he has a very frank and honest discussion with an old lady, and it's just, it's it's very charming. <laughs> yeah. It's a good show. Brian. Yeah. How about you tell us about True Detective Season 3? You guys watching this show? I didn't know it started airing. There's Oops. three episodes out. Oh. It's, okay, it's so fucking good. Yeah. Um, I love True Detective. I think we all like this show. Yeah. Do you guys feel like we're the only three people on Earth who thought Season 2 was amazing? I, sometimes yes. I do. Yeah. People what hate it. Fuck. I love it. I yeah, think that's like some cringe. of the most powerful TV and acting I'd ever seen. That, people hate it. That episode in the drug house? Yeah. Like, that's that's some bad shit. Yeah. Um, True Detective Season 3 is much more similar to Season 1. I think that's maybe where it lost people because season two was such a different thing to season one. Um, it stars Maher Shala Ali, uh, who is the uncle in Spider Man and the Spider Verse, and he's in Moonlight. I think we were talking about in the last episode. Paperboy. No. No, that's the dad. That's the dad. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he plays a detective called. Oh, thinking of his nickname which okay. is 
which is purple haze, but I think it's Wayne haze. And it's three different timelines. One of him in the 80s, one of him in the 90s, and one of him in 2015. Wow. Oh, okay, cool. And I think season one of True Detective had two timelines. Season two had no timeline, but had a big cast of characters. Yeah. You could say it in the way it had a timeline because it's dealing with the past a lot. Yeah. The ramifications rather than showing it, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, but then with this, it's just one detective. Now, he has a partner, but his partner is only in one of the timelines, really. Not so much the other ones. Um, and it's like like he is a leading man, and I think everyone else is supporting mm. his story. And he is solving uh, a murder of two children that went missing and uh, in the 1980s, and the case is just a big part of his life. But he's also a Vietnam veteran, so he'll meet other Vietnam veterans, and he'll have this connection with them right away. Uh, which is super interesting, but then like, like it, like it's a really, really complex show that has all these different details happening in each timeline. So in the eighties, he's like in his late twenties, early thirties, I guess, and then in the nineties, he's a dad and he has two children, and this is after the case has been solved, but we don't know the outcome of the case. We just know that he's survived it, but then it kind of comes back into the limelight and. There's more more that needs to be solved. And then in 2015, he's a granddad. And like it's the same actor, just some makeup. But he, uh, in this, he's a granddad and he has memory problems. He I don't know if it's Alzheimer's or not, but he's having blackouts. But he's on a Talking Heads crew try, true, true crime murder show. And they even like ho- make a point of it that like, his son, who's now an adult, is showing him online that like people are real into like true crime. And That's he's like, so cool. And he's like, why would people be into that? Like, this is some really heavy stuff that like fucks you up mentally. Because people are fucked up. Yeah, and I, I listen to a lot of true crime. Same here. Sometimes I fall asleep to it. And that is that's extremely fucked. Michelle started doing it, and so now I do it too. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but like, God. but like, it's really interesting because like nightmare because like. <laughs> He's been filmed for this documentary and it's obviously like making a murder or the staircase or one of those true crime heavy set kind of shows, but the show is called True Crime Season (laughs) 3. And he's only doing it because the director of the show um, has information on the case that he'd like to hear. But he also has memory problems and he can't recount the case, but he feels he needs to do it to jog his memory as well. And there's only three episodes out, and th- it's such a layered show already. It's beautifully filmed, beautifully acted. Like, there's interrogation scenes where the person being interrogated is just chewing up the scenery, and it's so intense. Uh, highly recommend it. Excellent. A firm thumbs down there from Ryan. Yeah. Um, thumbs down so hard that it bursts through the ground right up into the air again. Shit, that's how physics work. Yeah. Totally. Um, I think we also have something else that we've all seen. The favorite, yeah, yeah. And Brittany, you briefly mentioned this on last week's episode. I did. No, it was me. <laughs> it was all me. Brian, I can't argue with that. Uh, it was Brian me. said he didn't care yeah. about it, and if That's, this was going to be nominated for Oscars, movie, though, he'd Brian. freak out. I said we should wait <laughs> until the next episode until we've all watched. That's this. not how I remember it. Yeah, and there's definitely no recording yeah, to no way cooperate. To find out, so anyway, <laughs> I bet the fans will fucking back you up too. <laughs> Um, we all went to see the favorite. Yes. What did you guys think of this movie? Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. I'm sorry, I ruined the rhythm of that because I was. I, was I, I I thought you were gonna be like, it was okay. You know, don't really gel with me because of you know my male identity. Well, let me tell you about some plot holes that. Uh... <laughs> Really, just you know breaks. the time period that it takes place in is actually a lot more ambiguous than they make out in the film, and so um, you know how much actual credibility as a historical document does it really have? I don't think they would race ducks. <laughs> they would totally fucking okay, race. Yeah, okay, oh, actually, you know, did. real talk. It was the moments that they started racing ducks that I was like, oh, okay, because I basically spent the first five minutes of that movie just being like, this is fucking weird. Because first of all, every shot is this upward shot. Like, every shot of the characters talking is this real low-angle shot. And it's it's really unflattering to a lot of those actors. 
And then I was really worried for a moment because the characters were talking in quips. And I was like, oh, no. Because I knew you were both into this movie. And I was like, oh, fuck, am I going to hate this? But then that kind of, I don't know, it's like, it's like I kind of got what the film was going for after the ducks because I was like, well, this is partially kind of ridiculous. And I had so much fun with it after that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Neve, do you want to tell us what this movie is about? This is a story of Queen Anne and court politics. Queen Anne has a favorite, her kind of advisor, played by Rachel Vice, And she is... So much of the Queen's advisor, and the Queen is kind of a little mad, and she's mad because she's dealt with a lot of loss in her life. So how many miscarriages? Was it 17? 17. Yeah. 17. Um, that she's kind of actually pulling the political strings, really, and her husband is is, is, a, is a general in the army against France. So it's England and France. Um, along comes her cousin, who has been deladified, she has lost her station, and she's coming to ask for work at the castle. She was sold to a balloon-shaped man with a tiny cock, I believe is the word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, she's played by Emma Stone. And, and, and then the Queen is played by Olivia Colman. Yeah, and she sees the, um, the workings of court favourites and how generating favour with the Queen could lead to her getting her ladyship back and getting a comfortable position. Because when she arrives at the um, at the manor, she is basically turned into a scullery maid. All that shit is so fucking dark. The yeah. bit with the lie, where she's washing stuff, but it's lie and that, like, oh, that yeah. burns your flesh. The other maids kind of treat her like crap. She's abused. Like, she was, she's an ex-lady. And obviously the maids have no love for ladies and she's the new girl. So they are pulling pranks on her and pranks that are literally scarring her. Yeah. And it's just a very elaborate story about court politics, really. Well, Neve, if you look into the subtext, there's also some gay shit in there. Oh, there's a lot of gay shit. (laughs) So to be one there. (laughs) <laughs> to be one's favorite also means going down on the queen. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people going down on the queen, and um, it turns into this weird, I guess, love triangle. Like, there's a lot of people playing each other and getting what they want, and it's kind of fantastic. It's yeah, it's it's pretty amazing because you like they're trying to play well. At least Emma Stone's character, because I think Rachel Vice's character was kind of mostly genuine with her feelings with the queen yeah some stuff later on in the film made me think made me wonder that but yeah. I, I do feel like she genuinely cared about the queen they mm. portray him as childhood friends so it's not like yeah, yeah she was more invested but like there is just there is games afoot and it's like do you really want the person who is in control of your life to be this mad queen You know, and I think there's like bits throughout the end where you kind of see Emma Stone's character being like, oh, no. Yeah. And it's kind of like there was a lovely moment at the end where I felt like it was kind of like, how far has she really come? Yeah. Like, do do you actually win in this game? Yeah. You know, it it felt like she had escaped one situation to end up in an exact same situation. And it was it was very good. Um, I cannot talk enough about how funny parts of this film are. There was... I love Nicholas Holt's character, oh, that fop. Fucking brilliant. Um, he, he, the Tony from Skins, a beast from the X-Men. Yeah. He played like this kind of foppish lord who was just an awful human being. The shit he was saying to Rachel Weisz. And like... Some of it was just... It was so vile. And like the thing is, this is the second movie they've done together because he was a child actor and he was in About a Boy and Rachel Weisz is also in oh, that movie. yeah. So they've worked together. But even the way, the way he treats Emma Stone especially. Yeah. Oh god. The bit, yeah, the, bit, the bit where he pushes her just for no reason. Just pushes her into a ditch. There's some great physical comedy there in is. this. Yeah. There's a bit where they're talking and like they're negotiating and it's kind of subtle and one's saying like one's saying one thing and there's kind of half saying another thing and then he just goes do you want to get punched? 
<laughs> and it's like, oh, it's so good. I was so into the vibe of this game, of the, this film, because it was like, it was really kind of funny and endearing, but there was like this fucking dark undertone to it all. And like, the way I would describe it is like, in a hundred years, that castle would be a stage from Bloodborne. Oh yeah, totally. Those yeah. costumes. The costuming in this is fantastic. The so woman good. who did the costume design is nominated twice this year. Mm-hmm. What else is she nominated for? Uh, shit. Because see, the thing is, the favorite was actually made like two years ago. The production mm-hmm. of it was two years ago. Um, so she did costume design, the favorite, and she did something else that I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm 100% sure she's nominated twice. Her name is Sandy Powell, and just her own personal fashion is kind of amazing. Yeah. She just she has bright red orange hair, and she just wears crazy amazing clothes. Oh, she's Mary really Poppins. Cool. Oh, Mary Poppins looks cool as well. Um, I, I I love this film. I really I thought it was great. Yeah, I thought it was it was a joy. I uh, think it's my favorite period film. Now. I'm, I'm really like not yeah. into period films except like Game of Thrones. Okay, it's not, uh, <laughs> that's a callback. It's a callback to a story I told long ago on this podcast. Um, yeah, it was really fun. Have you seen other films by this director? Yes. No, you were telling me about them. Yeah, I, I'm gonna read out his name. <laughs> He's a Greek director called Yorgos Lanthimos. Lanthimos. What did you make of his other works? Indeed? I've only seen um, The Lobster, and I thought it was okay. I, uh, I've okay. So I've seen The Lobster and Killing of a Sacred Deer. The thing is, with those, he wrote and directed them. With the favorite, it's just an, it's just him directing a screenplay. Okay. And so his films are like super awkward and stilted. But I think mm-hmm. the favorite is like. It's him working with everyone else, and it's less of his vision. It's more. I think of... that's what jammed me up in the first five minutes, but that's also why I ended up loving the movie. Yeah, so like the lobster is really, like the lobster is you're either on board with it or you're not. Yeah, kind of. I, I thought I was on board with it, but I just wasn't entertained by it. But a lot of the same cast from the lobster are in the favorite, and it's filmed in a hotel in Kerry, which is really funny. And I've stayed in that hotel a bunch of times. Um, the favorite as well is an Irish production house. Yeah. So weird Irish connection here. Yeah, yeah, uh, they're, yeah. They're they're all done through the Irish film board, which is wild. Then Killing of a Sacred Deer is amazing. I highly recommend it. Oh, okay, cool. It's fucked up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could not say enough good things about that movie. Emma Stone was fucking fantastic in it. I thought. Yeah. I'm a really big Emma Stone fan. The scene where she beats shit out of a guy. It's pretty. It's pretty good. So Coleman's been nominated for Best Actress, and mm-hmm. then Vice and Stone are both uh, both nominated for Supporting, isn't it? Yeah. Well-deserved on yeah. all fronts. And it's up for Best Picture and, like, costuming as well. Yeah. yeah. I hope it does well. Me too. Um, Brian. Yeah. Tell us about Sorry to Bother You. Okay, I'll talk about this very quickly. Uh, do you guys know about Sorry to Bother You? Yeah. Uh, it stars Lakeith Stanfield, who plays Darius in Atlanta, and it's his first kind of lead role. Usually, he's in a supporting role, so it's cool to see him take on a lead role. And it's about it's like an alternative reality to our present day, and it's a much more bleaker version of America. You know, way way worse decisions have been made, but uh, and so the rich are the rich, and the poor are the poor. And it's about a black guy who works in a call center, and he learns that he can kind of game the system by doing a white guy voice and he's a telemarketer and he'll speak in a white guy voice and he does super well sales wise uh it's really his white guy voice is they actually dub him so it's david cross who played tobias in arrested development it's really Man, <laughs> like if you're gonna pick a white guy that's a- yeah that's the one. Uh, I think someone else is Pat Oswalt does their white guy voice, and then I think another person. I think another person is <laughs> there. Another person is Steve Buscemi as their white guy. Oh voice. my god! Okay. Like they're just such white guy voices, That's and it's real. Good. Like sorry to bother you, sir. Like just and like it's it's Danny Glover who was in the Lethal Weapon movies is the guy who's giving him the advice. And he's like, you have to talk from a place of complete security and contentment. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where you find your white guy voice. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. Uh, I wish I loved this film more, but I didn't like Super Lovish. I don't know why any reason in particular, because I was so looking forward to watching this. But do you, do you know when you watch a movie and like, you're just like, that was great, but like, 
I call them like I call them like eight out of tens. Yeah. Whereas like everything about the film you really like. Like it's music, it's cameras, it's like it's it's kind of like everything's really good, but there is just not that but it's it's nearly like it's appealing to you in very like normal ways, very predictable ways. Broad but maybe, strokes. Yeah, but yeah. maybe it's not showing you something you didn't expect. Yeah. Oh well, no. It's like there's some stuff in this film I did not expect, but I, I, I. It just I guess didn't... I mean more in terms of like a stylistic or like yeah. creative standpoint. Yeah, because this is it's directed by a dude called Boots Riley. I think it's his first film, but like I've spoken to other people about it, and I was like, "What do you think?" And I had a couple of people I've asked, and they've all been like, "I fucking love this film," and I can totally understand why because it, it like it's an excellent film, and I highly recommend it. I like. You know, you know how there'll be something and you can recommend it to someone, but like you're not 100% there. Yeah. Like, I, like I'm kind of like that with Fl- Flight of the Concords or something where it's like, I totally get why people like those, like that show and that band. I'm not into it. Yeah. But like, it's not, but like, it's not them. It's me. It's just, I'm just not into that kind of. Yeah. I know. I can think of a bunch of stuff like that. What's, what, what would be other examples of that for you guys? Cause for me, I think like, I like Gernlagen. It's like a solid eight out of ten show. Uh, People mobs... literally talk to me about how like Gurren Lagann changed their lives. Yeah, uh, Mob Psycho One Hundred's one. I will watch it when it's on, but I won't put it on myself. Yeah, but it's an excellent show. I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head, and none is coming to me. Um, probably maybe True Detective season one. Like I liked it. I didn't love it. That's a but, sad boy show. Yeah. Like you really, really, really appreciate it. Yeah, like I liked, I loved how it looked. I loved the mystery at the end, but like it just didn't hit me as hard as it hit other people. And then when two came along, and everyone totally hated that, and I was just like, "This is my favorite." <laughs> I felt <laughs> like I was being contrary or something. <laughs> yeah, that uh, sounds good though. You know, did you watch it on Blu-ray or did you go to cinema? I, I watched it at home. Okay, cool. <laughs> so it's out. Uh, it's available to watch. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's a really, really, really good. Film. I was really, I appreciate how you framed that question. Eve. Yeah, I, I, I watched it at home. You watched the Blu-ray version. Yeah, yeah. It's a Blu-ray you version. Watched a version that came from a Blu-ray. Maybe you put the Blu-ray in a Blu-ray player. Maybe something else happened. I don't. I'm not here to find that kind of stuff out. Yeah, the, yeah, the file said "br rip." What? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and with that, we're going to move into our strategy talk. Sorry, Boots Riley. Okay. Do this podcast will upload on the day that Resident Evil 2 releases? Yeah. yeah. Do we talk about the demo first or last? Let's talk about last. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you know what, Brian? Why yeah. don't you tell us about Momodora Reverie Under the Moonlight? This is my first big game that I played in 2019, and I love it. And it's already a contender in our Game of the Year podcast. Uh, this Neve gets so upset whenever we're like, "I think this is going to be a contender for Game of the Year" because she. <laughs> She's like, I'm gonna have to fucking play this fucking thing now. Well, it's like I have literally never heard of this, and you're like, I, I this is, this is a game in a year. I, 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 it's I'm... really weird that you never heard of it because it's right up your alley. It's like a little <laughs> pixel art game featuring like sexy anime girls. It's cool. Yeah, it, it's a little pixel art game. Um, this is the fourth Momodora game apparently, yeah. but this is a prequel, so you don't need to have played the other Momodora games. Uh, this is done by a Japanese dude whose name I can't remember because he uses a fucking avatar name instead of his real name. Uh, I'm really, really sorry, dude. Brian, you get so upset about names. You don't need to. I just wanna. I just wanna credit the the, the creator. You are. You're talking about his game. Okay. Um. So, the other games are on itch.io, which is cool. So you 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 could go back and play them, and I guess they kind of came around. Like shortly after Cave Story, because they kind of feel like Cave Story, but then this one is on widescreen, and you can definitely tell it's an evolution of, you know, chibi pixel art. But I guess it plays like a Castlevania, Metroidvania, uh, but also a bit like Bloodborne as well, because there's like, you know, there's 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 torch lights that you light. Yeah, um, I I downloaded this game because I realized Brian was talking about a similar game. 
that I'd been kind of keeping an eye on for a while, and even you were just telling me about Galway and it sounded cool. This game's fucking good. It's real, real good. The thing that struck me first of all is like, it feels amazing. Yeah. Like, like you have a three hit combo and it feels so nice. I never get bored of hitting that three hit combo because like... And, 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 and the weapon is a maple leaf. The weapon's a little maple leaf. And like, there's a really... Whatever like balance they have of like just the right amount of in, in anticipation frames, hit stop, and there's a little screen shake when you hit it, it just feels so good to like lay into people. Yeah, you 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 play as a girl who's a cleric from a faraway village. She's showing up at the kingdom because a poison has started spreading to the outskirts of their village. But when she gets to the kingdom, she realizes that's the source of the poison, and the kingdom has just fallen to complete ruin. And you're just exploring. It's quite dark. Uh, a castle, yeah. You're meeting like insane people and stuff, but it's also the graphics are really cutesy. Yeah, it kind of has this like um, Secret of Mana aesthetic. And what I like about Secret of Mana is I felt like the enemies and the designs and that are so cute, but the music and kind of story to a lot of it is very dark. And I kind of I, I really dig that kind of cute dark vibe. Yeah, the 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 game took me like five hours to beat. Because it's got a little percentage meter about like how much of the map you're exploring, and like it kind of has this bit where it kind of starts in the middle, and you've kind of got like a choice of where you want to go. Really? Yeah. I didn't notice that so at all. I think I, I've just been going. Yeah. I'm playing New Game Plus, and I'm trying things from a different perspective, just 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 to see how it yeah. changes. I was a bit worried about the boss fights because I thought they seemed like overly simplistic. But then I just had the boss fight with like the the girl paladin who has yeah. the red sword. I must have played that fight like twenty or thirty times, and it was fucking brilliant. Yeah, like it felt like a fighting game. The final boss fight is excellent as well. Yeah. Although, let me ask you a question: I killed a boss and I got a power from her to like kind of summon meteorites or something. Yeah. But then whatever happened, I I fell down a hole or something and I died and I went back to bef- a checkpoint before I had beaten her and I fought her again and I didn't get that same power. Weird. Yeah. I don't know what that's about. But, um... Um, Bomb Service is the developer? Yeah. And it came out in 2016, so it's already docked points for our Game of the Year. Yeah, it came out in 2016. On what? On on, on Steam. And, yeah. then, and then on the PS4 in 2017. Damn it! And then on the Switch in January 2019. Okay, we got it. It's back in there. Yeah. But at a... At a deduction. Hey, no... Well, what we? <laughs> it's a switch. It's a switch release. It came out on Switch this year, 2019. Um, everybody, Hollow Knight, same deal. And same with Owlboy. That game broke. To- that was in top five. That game came out in 2017. I can't believe we are already positioning things for game of the year. <laughs> That's because we're fucking bollockses. Just a bunch of shits. Yeah. Totally. Uh, I think this game is really, really fucking cool. I'm kind of hoping that like um, I'm kind of at that eight out of ten position now, where I love everything this game is doing. I wanted to throw me a curveball, and I want, I want, I want to see something I wasn't expecting. But so far, I love it, and it is just beautiful to look at as well. The only game you ever need to play. The only game you'll ever need to play. Neve. No, you only played the Resident Evil demo. I played Travis Strikes <laughs> again. No more heroes. Is it good? Um, I have seen some of the reviews for this. This game has gotten really mixed reviews, and like some of the worst are like one out of five. I cannot for the life of me understand why the game is scoring that low. Really? So you're enjoying it? I'm really enjoying it. Um, It's like, it's... It is definitely... It is not a game with a big budget. You get a really beautiful, awesome cutscene to start with that just looks amazing and is no more heroes as fuck. After that, it's a lot more like kind of characters talking back and forth through text. The gameplay is very simplistic, but to me it just kind of feels like a a shmup, like a shoot-em-up. It has that kind of kind of bullet hell sort of vibe and you have a lot of moves you can do and it also has that thing where like you can run around as Travis just waving waving the beam katana around and that'll kill enemies and that feels really good like it feels really meaty when you hit it with them but then you can use a strong attack where again he has a three hit combo and the animation on it is really nice and that final like spinning hit just feels so good and I'm not that far into it, but it really does feel like just more No More Heroes to me. It has that really weird, insane world. The second, the first, the first mid boss you fight is like a giant cow creature, and there's just a lot of personality in there. And 
maybe I'll cool on this game as it goes on, but right now I'm having a really good time with it. Why do you think it's scoring so low? Um, I think if you are not into this gameplay, you, there is nothing here for you. And if you're not a No More Heroes fan, like there's two very specific requirements. If you've never played No More Heroes, I could not make an argument for why you would enjoy this game. But I love No More Heroes, I love it to absolute death, and I've been having a good time with this one. I could, and now I'm very early on still, so I could sour on it and I'll report back, but I, I really like it. Yeah. That's good. Neve, you've been playing a bunch of Red Dead Redemption. Yeah. Did you beat it? See, I got to a point. No is the answer, and the answer is specifically because I'm not ready to do it. Okay, I'm one of these people because I know where this game is going. I, I figured out what was going to happen to Arthur in chapter two. You sure did. Um, So I know where it's going. And I'm one of these people that if after a big narrative change happens, I find it very hard to get into an open world and be like, that didn't happen. I'm just going to play these side missions because the, you know, the story seems so connected to his journey. Absolutely. There was later on in the game where I knew I still had silly side missions to do, and I was like, I just I couldn't because I was like, this the way the story is right now, it would kind of just break it for me. Yeah. So I kind of I I tried to get a lot of my side missions done, and then I pushed into chapter six, and I did a silly side mission in the middle of things, and it felt so bloody weird. Yeah. I did the one where you chase a man with dwarfism after beating up a. A freak show guy. Yes, I did that in chapter one. I did that in chapter six. It did not play well. No, I not. <laughs> it was really, really, really weird and did not like it was like, oh, okay. That's how are you, a tone. How are you feeling about the game? Um I love it. I think it's great. Yeah. Like I I I love Arthur. I love chapter six in all its horror. Um there's stuff I don't like as it's progressed, like chapter five when you go to Guarma. It gets so shooty. I, I feel like I've killed more people in that chapter than I did in the moments up to that chapter. Like, the death toll just exploded. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Um, And that's kind of kept going as well. Once you get back from Gwarma, there's more shooting. It does, and it's a shame, I feel like, because I feel like thematically there should be less shooting yeah. as it goes on. Yeah, exactly. Because like, there's a lot of narrative stuff as well where Arthur's kind of Arthur's questioning the gang. He's que questioning Dutch. He like takes Dutch up on shit, and he's just like, "You're killing people in cold blood, Dutch." And like, I've just murdered a lot of people. And I guess what Arthur's saying is, he was unarmed, and you killed him, and not like you know he was part of the shooting gallery that I killed everyone in. Yeah. But there is something. There's you know I'm fine with it. You can really separate the kind of narrative from the gameplay in this because there's sometimes feel so divorced from each other anyway. But there's moments where I'm like, this story is trying to make such a point of this, like such a point, and sometimes it's just doing a giant disservice to itself. Yeah, it seems like a core of this is how precious life is. Yeah. And and what you do with it and what your choices mean. Because like you know how in the Uncharted games it's the same thing. It's a shooting gallery, but they're never. They never really go into how precious life. Well, they, they like you know, it's never taken that seriously. Yeah, it's more like a Joss Whedon story where it's like, "Hey, we're shooting people and then joking." <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, "Okay, that's kind of weird, but whatever." Um, you can kind of understand it a bit more. But the major theme of this is kind of life and kind of what you do with it, I guess, and the choices you make and regret. Um, John, you finished it. I have finished Red Dead, which is crazy. <laughs> Both endings. Mm -hmm. um, had a lot of free time recently and I burned through a lot of it guys I, I got to, I got some stuff to say about this game okay go for it <sighs> okay there's this one mission in Red Dead where you stand at the top of a hill and you stand there with another character and he said there's a wagon coming I need you to rob what's on that wagon and I need you to not kill any of those and it did not kill either of the two drivers and then something really cool happens for every mission in red dead someone tells you what to do then a yellow point on your map map appears and usually a path will show you how to get there if you stand in the wrong place you will game over that doesn't happen for this one mission nothing happens 
The wagon is maybe 30 seconds away. You're on top of a hill. Figure out how to rob it without killing either of the drivers. Brilliant. Really good. I was so excited running down the hill. I was thinking, what am I going to do? Am I going to like try and distract them with some dynamite? Am I just going to jump on the wagon directly? In the end, I ended up like parking my horse in front of them. And then when they stopped and were like, why is this dang horse here? I like jumped on the way and beat the shit out of them. And it was, it was really fun. That is the only mission like that in the entire game. In the entire fucking game, every other mission, you are constrained and handheld. And I don't want to go into this too much because we've already talked about it at length. But I feel like it's such a shame because that one mission shows what this game could have been from a gameplay perspective. It could have been about choice and like you know whether you want to spare people or whether you want to be a murderer and all this kind of stuff and i feel like the amount of wasted potential there is staggering because the game feels good and i particularly had that problem in the last chapter where there's a lot of story stuff going on but i feel like it is literally being drowned in these massive shootouts like the Guarma bit, I actually didn't mind as much because to me it just mattered less. I, like, from a broader scale picture, I think they just should have just cut that Guarma bit. It wasn't interesting. Yeah, I kind of agree. Um, I think it was wasted for how much new assets were in it. Like, there's like, I loved it for the, uh, there's iguanas now, there's parrots, there's all this like Cuban island flora and fauna and you were there for only st story missions yeah. and you cannot explore it. Um, Seems like it could have been DLC somehow. Yeah. yeah. And I never got over that problem with the game. The game always felt like literally just a shooting gallery to me. There, you were, You're right, Neve. There was a, when you were saying like you kind of get used to it, there was a point where I kind of just got used to it and I was like, okay. But like, oh God, it's just what could have been that bothers me about that stuff. But I also say what could have been, because while I think the gameplay stuff is so weak, I think the story stuff is so fucking strong. Like, when I think the amount of video game stories that really, really got me from a real... I guess I want to say, like, traditional narrative perspective, there's not that many. There's games that have done weird stuff. Mother 3 does weird stuff that I love. Undertale does weird stuff I love. Lisa the Painful does weird stuff. But in terms of like, I guess, just pure narrative, there's, to me, there's like Silent Hill 2 and there's this. I think this game story is absolutely fucking fantastic. And for every bit of like misery I had to trudge through with the missions that were so repetitive and just, but even that could not sour the experience I had because I was so, so into the story. And it's hard because I feel like what that story is isn't apparent from early on at all. Because at the first I was like, okay, it's about like loyalty and camaraderie. And it's not. It's... Oh, how spoilery do I get with this? It, it, it... So I asked you the other day, you know, it's called Red Dead Redemption 2, but is there a story of redemption? There totally is. Um... Okay, fuck it. Like, if you're super, super sensitive to Red Dead spoilers, I'm going to include a time link, timestamp in the link below. Um, I'm going to keep it vague as I can, but I cannot talk about the great stuff about Red Dead without touching on some, some kind of mid to late game stuff. But I won't spoil anything massive. Um, Arthur is diagnosed with tuberculosis. Like, you're you're completely right, Eve, and. He finds out he only has so much time to live. And from that point on, it's when he really starts questioning Dutch. And it makes it this much bigger story than just his than just a relationship between him and Dutch. It becomes this, like, really honestly, quite profound exploration of like trying to do right with the time you have left. And the way some of the side missions tie into that is absolutely fucking beautiful and who anyone who's playing make sure you do the strauss missions because that's those are optional side quests and one of the strongest story moments for me came very late in that and it's just even this one sequence that's sold so well by arthur's voice actor he is fucking brilliant that guy like and he's good early on he's charming early on but he really injects these like zones tones of like 
mournfulness and like sorrow into the hardest hitting moments of that game and there's this line he has with Sadie when he just turns to her and he says people like me and you are more ghosts than people and when you hear that line in the context of that story with both these characters it means so fucking much and like it it hit me like a dump truck like it, it was amazing like i could not from going to a place where i was so lukewarm on this game starting off to the place that that line got me it was incredible but then the game does an epilogue and maybe people know what the epilogue is maybe they don't um i've heard people complain about the epilogue that it goes on for a long time and i'd say yes but so does every part of this game and to me the epilogue evolves what the game is about even further because i feel like first it's about loyalty then it's about mortality then it's about legacy and it does this really beautiful thing which i don't think very many video games do because i think a lot of video games when they talk about legacy they talk about biological legacy. They talk about passing this, like, you know, passing something down to your generation. And that is never passing something down, like some intangible gene to your ancestors and what a beautiful thing that is. That has never meant anything to me. That has never, I've never found that idea very inspiring or anything like that. This is much more directly how your actions create a legacy for other people. And the beautiful part about the epilogue is there's a real kind of there's shooting in it but there's also a lot more mundane stuff like i think for the first two hours of the epilogue you don't you barely i don't think you touch a gun and you get all these really kind of just normal but kind of really nice family moments and like these characters you know they don't quite click but they're showing a lot of love to each other and it's really nice and like I could see people being like, why is this in the game? And to me, it's because that shit is in the game because of everything Arthur did, because of the choices he made, and that is his lasting effect on the world. And that's kind of a message that I think even... It actually gets a little weaker when you tie it into Red Dead Redemption 1's story and how the story follows on. To me, this is a self-contained story, and Red Dead Redemption 1 is like... It's its own thing. You know, not saying better or worse, just it's its own thing. And by the end of it, like, I was really blown away. Like, I, I love this game, and I was not expecting to at all. It has so many problems. I have never nearly dropped a game that I end up loving so many times. And if someone hates this game, I understand that. But to me, it's one of those cases where the heavy swings it ends up hit it taking lands so hard that it justifies all the fucking bullshit and you know it has even in the later parts it has other problems like to me this the strongest parts of the stories aren't either of the game's endings the endings are actually pretty weak to me it's the moments that lead to those endings and i they will stay with me for a long time and i genuinely miss the game like, I, I miss playing it, and I miss being around those characters. So that was my final thoughts on Red Dead Redemption 2. I never thought I'd finish that game. I'm so glad I did. I feel pretty good about where we left it on Game of the Year, because I couldn't really push it any higher, considering the flaws I think it does have. But I loved it. And um, if you, like me, are like were are kind of struggling around Chapter 3, wondering if this game is for you, I found it so worthwhile to get to the end. Yeah, that's all I that's all I gotta say about that. How do you feel about your horse? Yeah. Wily Tim is one of the best friends I ever had. The one that you used to ride off a cliff? I didn't ride Wily Tim off a cliff. I rode Death Face off a cliff. Did you ride Riley Tim into a w Wily Tim into a wall? Only by accident. Jeez. Someone tried to rob Wily Tim stranger was like help friend and i got off and he robbed oily tim let me tell you it was a long painful night for that man <laughs> he doesn't have a face oh definitely not <laughs> he doesn't 
He does. I took away his face, and I took away everything that lies under the face. Did you do many of the side quests? Did you try and do as? Um, not that many. I was kind of satisfied with the amount mm. I did, and I don't think I did a lot. I think my final completion rating rating was like seventy percent. Mm. Um, there was definitely a lot of marks left on the map, but by the time I was into that game, was chapter six, and a lot of the side quests just didn't feel appropriate by then. I've done so many. They're yeah. so weird. I like the weird ones. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that this is where you've ended up in the game because I'm there with you. I love it a lot. Arthur, Arthur Morgan Zoom. is... He's a great character. He is close to my favorite gaming protagonist maybe ever. Mike is such a bastard. I fucking hate Mike. When he knows that Arthur's sick and he's calling him shit like Black, Black Long. Long. Yeah, oh. and just being like, you're looking kind of sick there, buddy. And you're just like, I want to kill you. <laughs> Fuck Dutch. Mm, fuck Dutch. I feel like the game's adherence to like being a canonical canonical part of Red Dead Redemption one storyline means you don't really get the ending with Dutch I needed. Mm. But I mean, I get it. I get what they did that. But part of me is like, did this even need to be the same story? I think this would have been a stronger story without any ties to Red Dead Redemption 1. Maybe people who have played Red Dead Redemption 1 all the way through feel differently about that. But to me, I think this would have been a better story if it was about a different group of outlaws because I think the themes would resonate a lot harder then. But yeah, uh, I fuck it. I love this game. Absolutely love it. I played New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. It's fine. <laughs> Is it a Mario game? Oh yeah, it's the most fucking... <laughs> <laughs> it is the most Mario game. This looks like plastic. I Oh, that that look, that is my least favorite period of Mario, where everything just looks like fucking shiny, hard nothing. Yeah, this is, this is the port of a Wii U launch title, and it's a perfectly serviceable 2D platformer Mario game that has minimal variety um i'm playing it at work and i'm playing with co-workers and all four of us are playing the four player in that game is a lot of fun that's my nice thing i want to say about that game the end you've also been playing iconoclasts yeah um i've stopped playing it though i got to a point in that game where i don't want to play it anymore yeah i, I really want to like it same um, there, there's some stuff I love in it. There's some amazing boss battles, and there's some really, 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 really cute sprite animation. But I got to this bit called the Ivory Tower, and I think if anyone has played a con- I, uh, this game, um, has gotten to the Ivory Tower, they know what I'm talking about. It's just, it's just a pain in the hole. You know what we were saying about how, like with um, with Bomodora and with Travis Strikes Again, it's like they just feel so good through that one basic action. Yeah, I don't like how the enemy, how fighting enemies in that game feels. I like the stomp. The stomp's fun. The stomp is a get out of quick situation. But like the shooting and the wrench shit just feels bad to me. Yeah, I don't like the range of the shooting. I yeah. find I always have to get too close and I always get hit. Yeah. Um. I wish I liked this game more. Uh, I'm glad I played it. I, I just played it because it was on PS Plus. And I played it on the Vita because it suited the Vita. I But I don't need to play this game anymore. And uh, the end. Cool. Then my other game is I played New Super Mario... or Sorry, Super Mario Party. Oh, I didn't know you played this. Okay. This game is fucking brilliant. Um, I played a couple of the Mario Party games. This is one of the good ones. This is the one on the Switch. And uh, I've been playing this at work as well, and it's a whole lot of bullshit and a whole lot of fun. I think um, I, I, I think Mario Party is fun to play. I also think it's perfectly fine just to watch a let's play of that. Like the giant bomb compilations come to come to my mind. I've never watched one of them all the way through, but I really want. They're four hours they're really long. Fun. Yeah, they're so funny. It's cool because like with those, because there's like over ten Mario Parties. They have this kind of thing where they always play the same characters, uh, except Dan wants to play Waluigi, but he can't play Waluigi for the first couple of games, so he has to play as Luigi. But then Jeff is always Mario, uh, Brad is always Wario, and then um, who's the other guy? The guy looks like Alex. Dex- no, Jason. Jason. Oh. No, not Jason. The guy, the, the guy left. Drew. Drew. Drew plays Yoshi. 
I saw Drew came back for the Christmas one, and I was like, oh. Um, and for me, that's kind of like my favorite era of Giant Bomb. We got an we got an email in. I don't think it's on the list, but someone was asking what podcast we recommend that are like ours. Uh, Giant Bomb, Giant Beast. We pretty much stole their format. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we'll continue to steal from them as long as it's profitable to us. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Those are the games I played. Uh, I really like Momodora. Mom- I can't wait to play more Momodora. I keep thinking about it. We also played the Resident Evil 2 remake demo. It certainly did. I, f- I felt like, you know, they could have could have done a lot more with this. Nope. <laughs> John, you are talking out your butthole. Brian! Because it's <laughs> fucking cool as fuck. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Zombies coming at you, pulling my trigger. Get the fuck out of my way. <laughs> I'm Leon. That is Leon's signature song. No, Leon's like, oh, I'll help you. Leon, I love how boy. scared Leon is. He's so plucky. He's really, really like, it's okay, you can do it. Like, he gives himself a little self-encouragement. I know, but I just, I love that Resident Evil 4 sweet spot, Leon, where he's sassy. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that noise exactly. <laughs> This is a 30 minute demo that you can only play once, then it times you out and you just have to uninstall it. That's a cool idea. Yeah, I think that's kind of fun. Um, Yeah, like, I don't have a whole lot to say. It was fucking great. It was great. Um, yeah. I love the lighting effects in this. Like, yeah, your because torch. when it's dark, yeah. it's fucking... And, like, it's interesting. I remember there was, like, a reset era thread or something a while ago about how, like, sort of a lot of dynamic lighting has kind of disappeared from games. Because remember, like, in games like Splinter Cell, when it was dark, it was dark. And this is the first game I've seen in forever that, like, shadow and light are actual mechanics. Like, as in, you will not see what's going on. Yeah, and your torch is really, really good. And whatever rendering they're doing on the viscera and gore, when your torch light hits it, it just looks wet and gross and sick. Yeah. And it just really leads to this spooky, scary atmosphere. Yeah, the modeling on a lot of the gore is insane. Um, I was really, really impressed with just, like, the generic zombie enemies and how different they all look to each other. There's, a, there's like, a lot going on. Because mm-hmm. usually with those, you'll have, like, five different zombies. Like, in Resident Evil 4, like, <laughs> you're, you're uh, going to see that one guy with the cap. You're going to see him a whole bunch. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought with this game, I think each one of them kind of had something unique about them. And, like, they're not just, um, you know, fodder. It took four headshots to get them down, and even then, they're not fully down yet. I don't think they're ever fully down. Yeah, I think like they, they'll like wake they up if you back. step over them. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, I, I think the only way to really properly kill them is to like shotgun blow off their limbs. Yeah, which fair enough. I love that their heads aren't connected properly through the neck anymore, so they kind of flop around. So it's really hard to get a headshot sometimes because yeah. it'll just like ragdoll all of a sudden to the other side of their shoulder i remember like i was kind of worried about the game because I, I did i like haven't looked up many stuff and like you know it's it can be hard to tell with this stuff but even just like from the first touch seeing that police station rendered to the level it's at moving at 60 i think it's 60 frames a second yeah i think so it's beautiful the shooting feels satisfying yeah, as well um i can't wait i took friday off work for it neve i know and then they found out it was for a game and i felt such shame no you didn't <laughs> No, not really. I'm, it's going to be great. Yeah, yeah. I got the collector's edition. I'm going to have a great time. There's a bunch of people at work who are taking next week off for fucking Kingdom Hearts. And like, you can make fun of them. Like, it's Yeah, that's You can bullshit. absolutely make fun of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are. You know you listen to this. And I, you know what I fucking think of you. I now know also what I think of you. Like, someday I'm going to be walking through that place. And Brian's going to be like, there they are. And I'm going to be like... <laughs> Oh. Like, take it off a of Resident Evil, dude. It's way cooler. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm super pumped to play the game. I think that's kind of all I got to say about it. Yeah, Super gore. Too. Super gore, yeah. Yeah. Um, this episode is going to be called Super Gore. Nice, I yeah, like yeah. it. Yeah, that's a good title. I think there's one more game that we're going to play now. Correct. <laughs> you forgot, didn't you? That was such a good segue, and John was like, <laughs> <laughs> That is what I sound like. You really are a dum-dum. Brian! 
You said it first. Okay, so we have to do our annual predictions game for the podcast. This, in one year's time, will crown a dark new queen. Do you know what? An ascended prince, some might say. Um, a Norded prince. I, 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 I think it's cool that Neve won, so Neve's the queen, but then I'm like the favorite. Oh my god, yeah! Yeah! <laughs> I don't know which one. I, I I think I'll be Rachel Vice and I'll be in my Bloodborne yeah. out, Hunter outfit. I'm not sure how comfortable this comparison makes me. <laughs> well, you're like a fop. <laughs> or how about you're that lobster that was potentially going to be raced? Well, that's how I feel most of the time. Or a rabbit being um, stepped on. Our first prediction for 2019. A little bit of a softball. Will a Final Fantasy VII trailer release this year? And we say trailer because we think it's so fucking unlikely that game is coming out this year. And just to quantify, trailer is like a significant amount of new information. Not one of their little remix trailers where you get like a couple of seconds new gameplay and some new shots. Like really solid ass new footage. Brian. No. You? No. Yes. 100%. You are absolutely going to get that. You guys are crazy. I think Square Enix are going to fucking just sit on their fucking Kingdom Hearts tree achievement for the next 12 months. <laughs> I think for the next 12 years. <laughs> no, here's what we're going to get. You're going to just do loads of Kingdom Hearts deals. No, we're going to get a brand new 7 minute Final Fantasy 7 remake trailer, none of which will be in the final game. Do you not want to be the queen? You guys are insane! Oh my, this is like an easy point for me. Okay, fair. Sure. We'll see. We'll yeah, see. Yeah. Like, if that, if a Final Fantasy trailer does not release this year, I will do a forfeit this time next year. <laughs> Happily, because that is how confident I am in this. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe for one point you're going to throw away the whole game. Uh, I'm not going to throw away the whole game. I'm... John's real fucking petty. You know what he's like. <laughs> I'm not throwing away the whole game. I'm playing the game. You guys are the fools. If you don't think that Square Enix aren't going to release some fucking trailer, that is insane. It's more likely the game would release than they would release no trailer. And now you guys have so much ammo to fucking destroy me next year if this happens. No, it's a simple no from me and myself. By it the is an it. overly simple no by the sounds of it. Yeah. Nah. A sleeper hit will break our top five. So a sleeper hit, we do this every year. A game we've never heard of cracking our top five. No. Brian says no. I'm going to say yes. And I am also going to say yes. Now, I don't know... No, that has happened. That probably has happened. Yeah. An N64 Mini will release. Mm. Uh, they can get N64 ROMs working successfully on the Wii and the Wii U, but I know N64 ROMs are extremely fickle, and I'm saying ROMs because, like... Let's be fucking real with what Nintendo or have it all have on the fucking motherboard of those things. Yep. It's a fucking ROM. Uh, with an N64 Mini, it might need a fan. Now, they have a lot of fans because the Switch has a fan. They probably have a warehouse full of that. They wouldn't need a fan. The RetroPie needs a fan to r run N64 ROMs. Um, I'm just comparing it to that because I recently got one. I'm going to say no. I'm, I don't think they're going to release one. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no as well. I think we're on mini console burnout because of the PlayStation <laughs> Mini's <laughs> disastrous launch. Yeah, good going. Breath of the Wild will receive a Majora's Mask-esque sequel. So, just say what you think that is. Like, a pretty much a completely different game, but with a lot of the same assets. So... For Majora's Mask, like it took a lot of what Ocarina did, it was the same art style, same 3D, and it just enhanced it in different ways, kind of made it more story focused, I guess. Same game engine. Yeah. yeah. And our and will Breath of will there be something similar to that to Breath of? Yeah. Because so, they've never done that with any other Zelda game since then, have they? Except, yeah. except maybe Spirit Tracks. Yeah, except maybe Spirit Tracks. Um, and this is just like it's just an announcement. It's not coming out this year. Yeah. Just an announcement. And 
yeah, it, it just uses the same engine, game engine. Like, like you look at it and you go, oh, okay, it's more, it's more Breath of the Wild, but maybe they're going to go a different way story-wise. Neve, what do you say? Yes. Brian. No. Fuck. I'm going to go no. Fuck. <laughs> I say no because so much of Breath of the Wild is designed for our, for the world itself. I, I say no, I hope they do. Yeah. I say yes because that world is barren and they need to put more shit in it anyway. I like how you're throwing away this prediction for one final jab at Breath of the Wild. <laughs> you can't see this because it's an audio version but she looks so fucking happy with herself. Yeah, she looks like a smug motherfucker. <laughs> um, E3 2019 is massively underwhelming. Yes. Yes. Uh, so what that is is a lot of the headlines post E3 use words like lackluster, underwhelming, lukewarm. Yeah, it's like a talking point. Yeah. I'm going to say no. Despite the fact that we know that... Sony won't be there. Because Sony had such an amazing press conference last year. Fair. But what do you think is going to compensate for nothing? Microsoft could come out with whatever new console, I guess. Conquers every, day. every other publisher... You, you think there's going to be some announcements, like some big, big hit announcements? Um, not so much, but I just, I don't know if it's going to be like, I don't think, un, I, 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 I don't think it's in a dire enough place that like it's, is going to be massively underwhelming. I think it is. We shall see. Maybe you, you, you agree with me. She I agree. Said, yeah. yeah, I said. Okay, I I'm just, I'm just making sure anyone agrees with me because she's you know. I hope not though. I really like E3. Yeah, yeah. me too. Um, okay. Which of these games will come out this year? Each of these is worth one point. The Last of Us 2. Brian. I think that comes out by the end of the year. Neve. Yes, it comes out this year. I also think that comes out this year. Death Stranding. No. Yes. I don't. I say no. Neve, you are... I'm fucking up. <laughs> Cyberpunk 2020. No. No. I mean, it's in the fucking title. It's a 2020. No, it's like 2077 or something. Damn it! <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 2077. Uh, I also say no. I, I don't think we're seeing that for a long time. Yeah. Although people say it, but apparently it's done and they're bug fixing. It's still gonna take a year. Yeah, I, I. Days Gone will be both a critical and commercial success. What do we define that as? Okay. Plus 85 Metacritic and just sells well. Okay. Like, do, do, does it sell the same amount as, like, God of War and Horizon Actually, no. Zero Dawn? Because, like, this is a PS4 exclusive and I'm thinking of other PS4 exclusives. I think if it, it sells as well as Horizon Zero Dawn. I think that was like the best-selling yeah. PS4 exclusive before God of War. Yeah, like, it sold super well. I think it's, I think it's still in the top five. I'm going to say no. No. John? I'm going to say no. Like, it'll sell better than, like, The Order 1886, but it won't sell as well as Horizon Zero Dawn. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice will break our top three. Top three. Like, we're really... But then we're, like... We can control that. We're... N I said this last year. We'll forget. By the time Game of the Year comes around, we will not give a shit about this, and we sure as fuck won't care about like losing a point or two over it, mm -hmm. because we'll be so into our, like, I'm gonna be like, like me and your brother are gonna be like, put Momodora! And then we'll just, <laughs> shut up, it's all about Days Gone now! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you like that game so much. Dude. Yeah. It's the bike. <laughs> it's, the bike. <laughs> it's the zombies. You just really, really enjoy those fetch quests and delivering letters. <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, I'm gonna say yeah. I'm gonna say I yeah. I'm gonna say yeah as well. Yeah, we're all fucking hyped for that <laughs> yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah, it'd be the only time a FromSoft game... Like, oh, no, Dark Souls 3 didn't do that well. Yeah, because w w we all had some sort of fatigue with it. Yeah. Even though we all appreciate that game and, like, it's great. But then, just... Bloodborne was number two, and I, I think that's still, like... That is actually probably the favorite game of this podcast. It's the one we all hold in the highest regard, even though somehow now we are solid by it. <laughs> Weird times. I just think if we'd all played it that year, yeah. it would have been different. But Maybe, it's just yeah. fucking 
snake snuck his way in there. He sure did. Um, Brian, what do you think? Uh, I say yes. You? Oh, this is for Sekiro in the top yep. tree? Yes. Which of these characters will be in the new Super Smash Bros? Yeah, so there's five planned characters, I think, for 2019. Uh, or maybe there's six, but two of them are Piranha Plant and Joker from Persona 5. Mm-hmm. So there's four other, there's either three or four characters up for announcement, and they'll come out by the end of the year, I think. Yeah, so for the end of the year, 2B, Brian? Yes. Me. Yes. I'm going to say no. I think 2B has a really, really, really good chance of being a Smash Ultimate. Uh, because, well, uh, no, no, go on, keep, keep going. Or any character from Undertale. No. No. Yes. Very Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is there any Western character in Smash? No. Okay. Because I, because I came across a Twitter page today that was like put Lara Croft in Smash, which I love. And then I was just like, is there any Western property that's no, in it? No, but the guest characters are no longer being decided by Sakurai. They're being decided by, like, Nintendo General. Okay. Hmm. Um, yeah, because... Do you want to make a guess at a character that could be introduced then? Sure. Sure. Uh, For five points. <laughs> mine is... I don't know how to pronounce his name. It's either Gino or Gino or Gano. He is the wooden puppet character in... Uh, Super Mario RPG. No way. He's the character. Whenever I see him on a list, I'm like, whenever I see him on a leak list, I'm like, this is fake. Put him on. I, okay. So he's my fucking wild card. Okay. Because why the fuck not? Like, they put Krom in Smash, and that was a fucking joke for years. Um, Leon S. Kennedy. That's a good one. There, like, there, there, there are other Capcom characters in Smash. Uh, Banjo Kazooie. That's a Western IP, are you sure? Okay. <laughs> that rare own, 100%. He said yeah? Yeah. Hey. Because he likes being a pleb. I'm gonna make you eat shit. It's your brain from I don't that. I honestly, I think it's as good as <laughs> Leon worry. or Gino. You Especially think, Gino, Ryan. Do, do, do you think Magic is in? You're basically just tossing away a point, just being like, fuck it. Who cares? Who Doesn't the fuck, matter. Who the fuck saw Duck on Dog showing up? Exactly. Okay, and our final one. And this was Neve's idea, and I can't quite figure out how, but I feel like Neve is fucking with me with this one a little bit. Shenmue 3 will break our top 10. So, so you think Shenmue Tree is going to come out? I didn't say if it's coming out. This is Neves. No. <laughs> no! Oh, and I think I think Shenmue 3 will come out this year because they will run out of money. <laughs> like, <laughs> what, it's going to be like another Quiet Man or something? No, it's not going to be a Quiet Man. <laughs> I think it is. It's not. I'm a weird, awkward karate boy, and I'm gonna force. Don't you it. fucking do an impression of me? <laughs> Imagine that guy's in Smash. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can I revise my answer? No. If you want, it's more likely than Banjo fucking Kazooie. Okay, Banjo Kazooie will be would get in a thousand times before Gino would get in. You think so? Hundred percent. Okay. That is, that is weird Nintendo fan wank thinking Gino is gonna be in there. Yeah, Ice Climbers. Sakurai. Nintendo. No, you're crazy. Anyway, Shenmue three. Top ten, Brian. No. No. Because I'm thinking, if I love Shenmue 3, I know I can push it to top 10. I think that game's going to break my heart. Oh, this is hard. <laughs> you really, really want to say yes, don't you? I really, really want to say yes. And what are you going to say? I'm going to say yes. Oh, this is such a fucking trap. Where you are. Now I get it. Now I see how you're fucking on <laughs> me. Well, John?
<laughs> Did you back this on Kickstarter? Yes. <laughs> what the- I can't believe you were going to say no. <laughs> well, <laughs> the no kind of comes from stuff I've seen recently. You're such a naive fool. <laughs> Oh, this happens every year. I bet with my fucking heart, and I <laughs> end up suffering for an entire other year. Oh. Quick time events. Okay, a lot of. I'm gonna say interesting stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it's been a. It's been a. It's been a it's been a wild one, to you, say the least. Usually January just has a bunch of like normal news. I think we have more shit shows in January than we did last year. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll start off with a small one. Mortal Kombat 11 was revealed. Did you guys see the videos or anything? Yeah. Nah. What do you think? Don't look good. Yeah. Um. These people die pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Those are visceral. Yeah. I like the part where Baraka bites off your face, and then your skull, and then eats your brain. It's the full meal. Yeah. Yum yum. All the food groups. Uh, Ronda Rousey. Yeah. She's Sonya Blade. She doesn't. She doesn't seem like a Sonya Blade to me. I don't think her face looks very good in that game, and I think Ronda Rousey yeah. is a cool looking person, but. Neverrealm have never excelled at female faces. Whatever it is, always looked pretty weird. I saw Sonya, and I, I like Sonya Blade a lot. I think she's really cool. I saw her face in the trailer, and I was like, ooh, <laughs> that looks strange. And then I saw Ronda Rousey, and I don't know. I just, I like my fighting game girls a lot, and I just feel like, like I wouldn't want Chun Li to have something like Chun-Li to me is Chun-Li she's fucking mm. Chun-Li who should she be in the next Street Fighter game who should play Chun-Li I'll tell you who Chun fucking Lee and I kind of feel like Sonya Blade has always been like a fun character but like never particularly great not like a whole lot of personality or anything but I feel like they kind of started giving her personality in Mortal Kombat 10 where she was like a fight mom now she was like an older lady and she was fucking really brutal and really cool and she like had more steel to her and i appreciated that like she wasn't like the she wasn't she wasn't the boob city she was in mortal kombat 9 and i feel like now you're kind of taking that identity and kind of watering it down a little bit just to make her onto rosie which is basically like a kind of pr stunt you know and i say that as someone who likes tanya blade and likes ronda rosie I thought it was weird that they didn't make a new character for her. That's what I would love. Mm. I would love, like, like a character based on Ronda Rousey. Just a cage fighter who kills people. That I, that I would main that character. Missed opportunity. Yeah, Kinda. Totally. Little, yeah. But, um, other than that, I think the game looks great. I think it's really cool that they have... They have two meters now. One for offensive moves and one for defensive moves. And that looks really cool. The animation looks a lot better than it does in some of the previous Mortal Kombat games, and I'm excited about it. Can't wait for that to land between 20 and 10 in our game of the year. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Oh, where to go? Okay, let, let, let's let's get through the shit, and then let's get to the nice news. <sighs> Neve. Okay. Why don't you take us through the Assassin's Creed DLC. This... This was a whole lot. Buckle up, everyone. This is yeah. for Assassin's Creed Odyssey that came out last year. Yeah. So, let me take you back to maybe E3 2018. This is the announcement trailer of Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And if you remember from that E3, there was a lot of positive and a bit of negative um attention around the last of us 2 trailer because of the uh the lesbian kiss in it so there was a lot of hype there was also a lot of sadness deep deep sadness because we (laughs) realized that anthem the bioware game would not have companions in it what's even the point what is even the point of a bioware game so there was this kind of vacuum to be filled and the Ubisoft marketing team saw that vacuum and they went and they filled it hard. So after E3, a lot of talk was given to the uh, aspect that you could romance 
same-sex characters in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. You could pick Alexios or you could pick Cassandra and you could have a lesbian, gay, bisexual romance. You could They even said you could be asexual. You don't have to engage with any romance at all. And this was like extreme marketing. I found at least four full-on interviews, two with the creative director on Entertainment Weekly and IGN, and there was lines such as, since the story is choice-driven, we never force players into romantic situations they might not be comfortable with. The narrative directors had inter- um, had interviews as well where she said, you know, we're making a game that offers choice, and this is something that matters to a lot of people. We're not forcing you to do something you don't want to do. So if you're someone who's asexual, you don't have to engage in something like this. It's not forced. It's very much your choice. If you're playing Alexios and you want to romance Solius, go for it. You do you, man. Solius is a male character in this. So they very, very, very strongly push the marketing for player choice in romancing same-sex relationships. Neve, that's great. Awesome. Moving on. Our next... <laughs> so why am I talking about this? Um, I kind of said before I thought the representation in the game was a little lacking, but at least I could roleplay Cassandra as a lesbian. I had the choice to do that. Two DLC episodes came out for the game, and the second one is called Legacy of the First Blade Shadow Heritage. And your character is forced into a heterosexual relationship, no matter what you do. You can say no to the character, you can be like, play down the romantic stuff. Your character, if you're playing Cassandra, will sleep with him, will say she loves him, will end up with him and have a baby with him. So, to keep the legacy sorry, going? I read somewhere, and I cannot remember where, that it was like, you get drunk and sleep with him? Yeah, so you can like say no to him kind of around anyway, but how it plays out is you're both drinking, it cuts to black. Okay. You that, have a that, baby. That's bad, but I guess I, I thought from that it would be like, that you'd be like, oh fuck, I got drunk and I slept with someone, that was bad. But no, this getting drunk is actually the start of like a romantic relationship. Yeah. Wow. So it kind of plays weirdly as well, because if you're saying no and then you get drunk and then you end up in this kind of relationship and a pregnancy, like what happened there? Like it's kind of it's kind of dodgy in the first place. But this is just really frustrating from a lot of LGBT um, gamers standpoint where they play this game like as a lesbian or as a gay man and then they are basically forced into a narrative situation where they are heterosexual. To be a breeding couple. Yeah, it's been hetconned. <laughs> which is really, really frustrating after putting 100 plus hours into a character that you felt was your own and that you could identify with. Um, so a lot of people were really upset about this and one of the major sources of this was a Reddit post from a lesbian who was talking about how upset she was about this, how she said no to the character, how she did not want this for her character and it happened anyway. And there was a lot of uproar about this. And again, LGBT people really felt like they were falsely marketed to and that this narrative of choice when it came to LGBT relationships was a complete lie if this is the route they were gonna go down. Um, They issued an apology and they kind of, it's weak. Like it isn't an apology. It's like, this is what we meant by it kind of thing. Oh dang, people misinterpreted us. Yeah, and like as, as Brian said, is it about the legacy kind of stuff? And that's what they're pushing. And I have a big problem with this, even from a narrative standpoint. Um, so I'm going to read the apology first. We want to an extent to apology to our players disappointed by a relationship your character partakes in. The intent of the story was to explain how your character's bloodline has a lasting impact on the assassins. But looking through your responses, it's clear that we missed the mark. Alexios, Cassandra, realizing their own mortality and sacrifice Leonidas and Marin men before them to keep the legacy alive, felt the desire and duty to preserve their important important lineage. Could they not adopt a kid? This, yeah, this is where it gets frustrating to me. So, like, if you're an Assassin's Creed fan, you will know that after three, DNA has no effect on the Animus system at all. The character you play as in the real wor- world, Leila San, uses a type of um, animus that doesn't deal with it. It's called the HR8. She built it herself, and you can access any memory. 
So you so don't she need is it. So 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 the so the, the present day person has no genetic no relationship with the the, the character you play as. No. Um, also, Odyssey is set before Origins. Origins is a game about the assassin's origins. It deals. It doesn't deal with bloodlines or legacy or ancestry at all. So that doesn't even line up. And Cassandra and Alexios are mercenaries. They're not assassins. And Cassandra is immortal and dies in 2018 at the end of the game. So why was she concerned about her mortality? And even from a further thematic point, her father threw her off a cliff. He didn't really care about his legacy that much. <laughs> and there's a real, really strong theme throughout it about like, like found families. Like Cassandra is adopted herself and she has an adopted child that spends a lot of time around her called Phoebe. And a lot of side missions involves Cassandra taking, um, taking care of orphan kids and doing little missions for them. So I think it would make way more sense from a legacy standpoint to drop the whole bloodline stuff and to adopt a child, because that would be a narrative true line that was there. And like what John was saying earlier about like Arthur and his legacy and how like the whole bloodline thing is like it's 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 so antiquated kind of st like it's lame. Yeah. It would seem way richer thematically for that character to adopt a character. It's way more of a, just a training and teaching thing. That's why I like yeah. the the Spider-Verse movie so much. Because it's like, these, these two dudes are not related to each other. But there's such a passing of the torch through mm -hmm. different mechanics. So, and... It's such a great way to tell a story. Even if they wanted to bring back that whole, like, legacy through DNA kind of thing, why do it in the game that you spent a huge marketing push on telling players it would not be part of the game, you know, where you could play as these characters and you did have these choices? Why undermine that in this game since they haven't done it since 3? Sometimes with stuff like this, I really question how it happens. And I'm not even, even talking about like a place of outrage. Like I'm genuinely curious what possible logic led to this because they had a very clear message with the marketing of the game and it's 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 so strange to me that they go against it like did they just think it wouldn't be a big deal like even just from like a strategic standpoint i'm like what happened there i think what they saw is they saw a vacuum after bioware and like people were making be memes like you know friendship ended with bioware ubisoft is my new friend like because they were like, oh cool, we're going to have this um, romance option stuff that Bioware has kind of dropped the ball on. I think they just saw an opportunity to market that way and did, but always had this narrative planned. So in their kind of desire to get the pink dollar, they, um, huh. it's, it's a marketing term, it's the purchasing power of gay people, they totally lied to people and falsely advertised this game. And they yeah. were kind of thought like, mm, it's a DLC, maybe people won't notice that much, or maybe won't people won't care, more people will buy it for the representation than be upset about this. Fake wokeness is, it's pretty yeah. insidious. And like, people were upset and people did feel lied to. I've seen people being like, I'm not buying Ubisoft games. People have been screen capping their own like marketing stuff and like sending it back to them. Even I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you said that, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I met a lovely collage of their quotes. Um, <laughs> It's like, it feels frustrating. It, it's it's painful, honestly. It's kind of cruel. I really don't like it. I think it's a really shitty, shitty move from them. And from a narrative perspective, from a marketing perspective, it doesn't make sense other than they saw an opportunity to market towards a minority group and they took it knowing full well that this is where this was going. What the fuck, Ubisoft? Mm -hmm. Bad shit. Just want to add one more thing to it because really adds salt to the wound. The name of the achievement when you get your stupid ugly CG baby to look at is called Growing Up. And if you have any idea of LGBT tropes, there's this idea that you're, you know, gay in college or kids are told that their feelings they'll grow out of. Yeah, they're going through a phase. Yeah, you're going through a phase. So to kind of get a tr um, an achievement that's called Growing Up because Cassandra has now settled down with a man and has a biological child after playing them as gay up until that point. You know, it really kind of smarts. <laughs> really <laughs> adds salt to it. <laughs> oh, God. Real fuck you from the developer. Wow. Yeah, that sucks. Is there going to be an Assassin's Creed uh, 
in October, November 2019. I think they're going to do Watch Dogs 3 this year. Yeah. Okay. Although and I then... heard a report that Ubisoft are planning to release four big games this year. Ooh, it might be then. Yeah, because yeah, they have two teams. They have, like, this was done by the second team. I would hope not, because I feel like they... Everything you just said, granted. But before that, they had really started to garner a lot of favor back with Origins and then... Um, odyssey and like even i myself was a little bit like well my cassandra is pretty cool maybe i'll give that a look someday but it would be a shame to see them kind of like like just burn out on the same formula again but yeah i guess we'll see guys there is some wacky shit happening over at gearbox some fucking tech savory cartoon bullshit going on gearbox is the studio that made the borderlands games yes and their creative director is... They also made Battleborn. <laughs> okay. And their creative director is a dude called... Randy Pitchford. Okay. And he's a character. Oh boy, is he. So, this all kicked off when it turned out that um, a former member of the general council of Gearbox, Wade Callender... And I laughed because I heard that name, Brian, because remember when, when we... When, you know when we make short films with Seamus? Yeah. And... We think up imaginary names for the credits, like <laughs> Billy Midnight, Johnny Tomorrow. Yeah. Wade Calendar sounds exactly like one of them. Yeah, that's a fake name pulled out of your ass. Yep, yeah, totally. That's not it. A... Um, he is suing Randy Pitchford for a variety of different things. He's accusing him of funneling $7 million in Borderlands development into his own personal fund, which goes to the I think it's called the I think it's just called the Randy Pitchford Magic organization. <laughs> Randy Pitchford is a notable magician which will become relevant to the story later on. And oh Randy Pitchford and maybe Gearbox as well, I'm not sure, are countersuing Wade Calendar saying that he stole a bunch of money and he spent it on things. <laughs> like gun license membership and attempting to get six pack abs. And these two men used to be friends. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of personal animosity in this as well. But one of the allegations, and we should stress, this is all allegations. There's no no victims have come forward in any of this. So, so this is two very special guys duking it out and we all get to hear their bullshit. Yeah, and this is all alleged. Um, and I, I hope it stays that way. I hope it's not real because otherwise some of this shit gets really dark. And I think this story is hilarious, but I, I also don't want to like, I don't want to gloss over the some of the potentially very vile implications here as well. One of which is that Wade Calendar has accused Randy Pitchford of having parties where adults expose themselves to underage girls. We don't have any like evidence of anything like that. No victims have come forward, and if they do, fuck this guy. I hope that is not true because that is some truly heinous awful evil shit but something rather strange happens in gearbox's defense of this they gearbox themselves gearbox's social media their public representation sent around a response to this saying that that's not what happened what happened and they sent a podcast called the piffle podcast the, the Piff Pod, it's called. And it's hosted by this magician called Piff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I, I, he, he's a really good magician. Is he? Oh, yeah, he's brilliant. Okay, yeah, because I was wondering, because I was listening to this podcast, and he sounded really into his shit. Well, yeah, yeah, it's a magician podcast. No, no, no like, like... Yeah, like, but I didn't know like, if he was just like a hobby or if he was professional. Yeah. And Piff the Magic Dragon has a bunch of stuff on uh, YouTube, and he was on Penn and Teller... Uh, show me your yeah, time. he mentioned that he's like buddies with them and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, he's very well respected. And so I wanted to do my journalistic duty, and I listened to this whole podcast because apparently during the course of the podcast, Randy tells a story. This is kind of gross. I'm, I'm I'm sorry, but also the human body is a thing. And fuck it, about a young woman who he a cam girl, someone who will you know, perform kind of semi or fully sexual acts in front of a camera for profit. 
and she he happened upon this one very special girl who could apparently produce a surprising amount when she ejaculates and I quote Randy directly on this one this is not a sex worker this is a fucking magician and this is what led the fact that she's a magician the fact that she's very good both Brian and Neve have their faces covered that's not magic <laughs> both Brian and Neve that's a, that's a mystery of the human body <laughs> I just think it's funny how a guy would see a woman have an orgasm and just be like this I is, guess it's this magic was my, this was my first thought as well if you think a female orgasm is magic then you need to be more attentive <laughs> yeah dude no cause there really is this weird stigma about female magicians it's but like, anyway, like, <laughs> like like, okay, name three female magicians, Neve. And we'll, oh, wait. <laughs> and, like, it's like, what? <laughs> Sarah, the, the amazing squirter. Is that what we're going for here? Well, no, her, her actual tag is barely 18. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> but anyway, so Randy tells this story, right? And he's like, he tells it, and then he's like, so I had this on a memory stick along with company secrets on a unencrypted memory stick that he left at a medieval times restaurant. And an <laughs> you mean like you mean like the one that's in the cable guy? The exact same. Where you one. watch people like joust yeah. while eating. <laughs> and people are eating meat off a bone. Um. Okay. Complete side note: If our American listeners have ever been to a medieval times, could you please tell us what it's like? Because I've always been skeptical if knights actually fight in them. Yeah. Uh, oh. I bet medieval time smells so bad. But anyway, I want to go. An <laughs> yeah, me too. An employee of medieval times finds this memory stick, excuse me, and um, brings it home, and their son <laughs> opens the memory stick oh and finds out both company secrets and the porn. <laughs> Randy, Randy's team contact the boy and they give him a bunch of, I quote, swag in return for the memory stick and his silence. That fool. <laughs> but Randy was away for when they got the memory stick back, and so his executive assistant looked at it, and when he got back, everyone knew what was on the memory stick, and especially the clip of the cam girl. And there's a bit that just really fucking made me crack up, where Randy's like, oh, you know what? How many of them do you think thought it was a bit magic? None. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Randy, because I don't think it fucking is. <laughs> like, so the like, there's idea... a litter, like a porn clip on a USB stick, and he's like, no one once considered it was for me. Yes, that's what he said. That was it. I'm not even. I'm not paraphrasing. I'm not like exaggerating this. This is literally the guy's excuse, and I'm actually really happy about this because. So it's it's not for sexual gratuity. It's just for the appreciation of the art of magic. Totally, and no, you two have both at separate stages seen stuff that have come up on my computer by accident. Oh yeah, and that was magic. That was just magic. I was just curious about magicians. Her uh, shirt was on, and then it was off. How'd you do it? I I I, I won't say what the words. John, Brian, you fucking better not. But Brian. I won't say what they are, but my reaction to them was me just screaming and you with your fucking head in the couch cushion. That was the fucking worst because we had you guys over for dinner and we just wanted to look up some fucking YouTube shit and then that came up. And like it had the recent searches in YouTube so cool. and what John had like put in earlier that afternoon. You saw the exact same thing. Do you like? Yeah. But I, I, it's, I, it's not that bad. Like you don't remember it, so it's not bad. It's just, <laughs> I was so fucking. I like black out every day yeah. though. So. Like, like it really, really wasn't bad, but it was just embarrassing for John. So it was hilarious. Because it was. It like, was magic. I just get curious about magicians. It was shit. not mm -hmm. magic. <sighs> anyway. So this was his excuse for the claim that he had like underage porn and well, now, the technically parties. barely legal it's not underage it's barely legal it's crazy to me that this guy would use the gearbox social media to disseminate this information yeah. like i feel bad for everyone working at gearbox do you know what's weird though this podcast came out on the 22nd of December, and I listened to this podcast because I was so fucking dumbfounded as to how this could come up in conversation. Like, how 
of this year are you sure it wasn't 2018 oh, okay yeah okay so then who, who 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 kind of brings up the subject randy does and randy is like the, the actually you know what the opening part of the podcast I actually kind of enjoyed because it was just them talking about different magic tricks and talking about like this amazing craftsman who's able to make all these like magic coins that lock together and like he basically makes the best like equipment and the best like trick equipment for doing magic oh, tricks yeah yeah but he makes like one thing a year yeah yeah, yeah. And... i can see how you would probably go from making squirting flowers to <laughs> Neve, that's too vulgar and i'm cutting that from the podcast <laughs> Um, I, I think the tagline for this episode is "We're squirting flowers." No, <laughs> no, no, that's too bold. I'm not. I don't want to be a part of that. Uh, raise your hand if you want that as the tagline. No, <laughs> the queens have spoken. <laughs> Children listen to this podcast. They shouldn't go you, to bed. Yeah, you shouldn't. If you're a child, if you're under eighteen and you just heard all that shit, fucking forget about it. Just stop it. Don't cancel your Patreon, but don't think of it. <laughs> Instantly we run sure into your to, bedroom like, wall and knock yourself out. <laughs> but like, you know, when we upload, we always make sure to tick the explicit box. I mostly remember. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I usually go back and I make sure it's there. It's like, I don't want to be held accountable for something. Oh, God. Okay. Anyway. But yeah. So this released on the 22nd of December, 2018. So a month ago, exactly. Yeah. And... So they're having this conversation with all this stuff, and Randy's like kind of, he's kind of, he's a little kind of reserved. He's not like quite full in there, you know, he's quite proper. And then at about the 40 minute mark, he launches into this story about his porny flash drive. Unprompted? Unprompted. Oh, yeah. Do you think he was trying to get it out of, I think before the story? Exactly. And that's why they were emailing it around? Yes, they were like, okay, Randy, we need you to explain this on a podcast, because it just has to be natural you know <laughs> <laughs> explain your porn so just work that you in. left at medieval times on your magic podcast <laughs> but, but make it natural is, what, that's such an elaborate ruse if he had just been like yeah i had some fucking porn on there yeah if you didn't play the stupid like <laughs> no one once considered it was for the magic trick and like if you were just like yeah i was watching porn i saved a video like an idiot onto a my work tom drive what is wrong with him <laughs> i don't know that's uh yeah so what fucked up shit do we have in our thumb drives a lot of pirated film <laughs> yeah a lot of pirated movies and a folder called to print and it's just like a bunch of a4 pages that i need to print mostly it sometimes there's like a zip fo- file file of comics that's about it a folder of like half-drawn PSDs, maybe. Yeah, with funny file names. John, how about you? John, you're not editing in. What the fuck you got? Nothing. Do you have a folder called Stuff? No. Then you've then you've got a folder called Real Stuff. <laughs> and then you've got a folder called Strong Stuff. Brian. Inspired by you guys, I made a folder called Stuff with the full intention of saving stuff there. What kind of stuff, Neve? Stuff. And then I saved one image, and I went. Yes, that's not. <laughs> um, we record this on my computer. I'm showing me of my folder here called stuff. <laughs> yeah, that seems about right. Yeah. What's what? Let me see. Can you turn it? No. Oh. <laughs> I can't. This workstation is set in place. Sure. My favorite I don't know. type Look, of I, stuff. I just I was clearing out an old computer today, and I found a bunch of stuff, and I was like, "Fucking jackpot!" <laughs> I forgot about all this shit. And I put it onto a hard drive, and now this conversation has me fucking, has me pretty, pretty spookered, I'll say that much. So what's on it? No, Brian. Is it magic? No, it's not. Yes. (laughs) Yes, it's all magic. It's all research. I am becoming a Twitch magician. So yeah, get ready for the Super iPad 12 hard drive leak on 4chan. (laughs) There's nothing on there that could get me in trouble. It'll just be... I think people would be like, yeah, man, he's into some cool stuff. No, shut up. Okay, let's, I don't like this. This is about Randy Pitchford. Randy Pitchford should be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, that's the end of that story, I guess. Uh, Going to be a hell of a time to see what happens there. Um, yeah, I'm too flustered. Someone take this hate bomb story. <laughs> All right. Uh, our, our golden boy H-bomber guy raises 340k. That's in dollars. 
Uh, we should we should take this one right back to the beginning. Actually. Yeah, yeah, we should. Uh, and destroys a transphobic Irish piece of trash. Yeah, this one. Okay, let's talk about Graham Lennon. Twenty years ago, Graham Lennon was part of the creation of a show called Doctor Ted. Father Ted, I'm all fucked what? up. <laughs> oh my Dr. god. Oh no, stop it. Stop maybe we should call him Dr. Dr. Ted. Ted. Yeah. Dr. Ted. <laughs> Dr. Ted. <laughs> I'm still all fucked up from the last section, okay? If you guys want to leave a comment that says Dr. Ted. No. <laughs> Okay, okay. Oh, this great. is still gonna be the last episode of the Let's Fight the Boss. Video. There was a really great show called Father Ted that just kind of formed without any direction from anyone. It, it was co written by Graham Lenehan and another man who we don't have a problem with called Arthur Matthews. And um, it was this really fantastic show. Like, if you haven't seen it, you should because it does, I haven't watched it recently. I, I've watched it in bits and pieces and I always think it's still hilarious. Yeah, I like sometimes I'll just watch clips on YouTube, but a year ago Neve and I were, did an episode with just the two of us and we recommended Father Ted to American listeners who just wanted to have like some weird context for Irish humour. Yeah, it takes mm -hmm. place on a weird island called Craggy Island that's like just a living nightmare. And it's a sitcom about Catholic priests. Yeah, and it's... Which is such a good idea. It's so good and they're such fucked up priests as well. It's It's brilliant. Anyway, and this the same guy also uh, cr uh, was the creator and writer of Black Books and the IT Crowd. Black I Books. Think, I think I hate the IT Crowd. Oh, same, same, I hate it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Black Books is good. The IT Crowd is a load of shite. Yeah. I don't like Black Books either. Really? Yeah, I never got into it. I love Dylan Moore. We're definitely gonna get a bunch of comments completely agreeing with us on this. <laughs> Um, so Father Ted, I think this stop like that that shit was made in like 1995 to 1998. Mm -hmm. So yeah, over 20 years ago. And so then Graham Lenehan, and like I haven't been following him super closely, but he was very supportive of um, a guy who was pretty much like a feminist, came out on a bunch of feminist issues and stuff like that. Just seemed yeah. all right. He 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 was a when big. When did yeah. the decline start? I, I have a timeline. Okay, okay perfect. Mm. He was a big vocal push on the abortion referendum for years because both him and his wife are Irish. They moved to the UK uh, like 20 odd years ago when he became a UK Channel 4 writer. And he speaks about Ireland as if I left that country behind me because of its barbaric Catholic ways. And he's him and his wife have spoken openly about having abortion, about, about both themselves deciding to have an abortion because they have two kids and they want to have a third kid. And they really, and they pushed a lot of that in social media. And at this time, his Twitter, like, because he has over 600,000 followers on Twitter. 659,000. Yeah. And his the way his Twitter was done is that he would just come up with these, like, clever one sentence, like, observations. But he'd been, but he's followed by like the Lonely Island and like Simpsons writers. He's followed by Becky Lynch. Yeah, like he's followed by so many people because like Father Ted is such a legacy. Because I think mm -hmm. a lot of Adult Swim shows even borrow from Father Ted, and it's just kind of this thing that got passed around after the internet became a thing. It is such a prototype of like broken humor shit. Yeah, for sure. Um, and after the the abortion referendum. Uh, happened in may of 2018 uh around that time that like people who had a voice and had a platform kind of needed to move on to something else uh around this time graham linehan uh got was recovering from testicular cancer and he had surgery and he was at home with his phone and for whatever fucking reason Instead of being a, a, a spokesperson for testicular cancer awareness, he decided to become a transphobe. Yeah, and he starts tweeting all day, like all fucking day. I about what I can't even tell because I don't not even actually... tweeting. He'll search his name, and he'll start replying to people's tweets in really weird ways as well. Yeah, like he's like. A habitual self searcher, like Lindsay Ellis, like with all of this meta tweet being like, "Yay, good, nice job, a job, H bomb," and like he was in her replies. Weird. So his opinion on transgender, and it's more so transgender women. 
Yeah, that seemed to be the target of his rage. Yeah. So, which is an odd distinction, but so, whatever. So Gay Pride Month is in June. So this kind of follows up from the referendum that was in May of last year. Yeah. But he was kind of slamming uh, trans people who were at Gay Pride. And I think he compared them to Nazis. And that he, is that is some some logic gymnastics. And right he there. was saying things that trans women are damaging. Uh, uh, I guess cis born arguing, women. I think he was arguing that it's another way for men to like subvert women or whatever. Yeah, and it's taking away from a feminist argument, whatever that means. Yeah, <sighs> it's infuriating because like. We don't get a lot of good media at Ireland, I don't really think. I think, like, there's some okay movies, there's Father I, Ted as yeah. a TV show, and there's Love Hate, which is actually pretty alright. We need to get fuck all else, and it's it really stings that now that show has this asshole as a caveat. Yeah, just this fucking tainted fucking shit scar. And, like, his tweets are bad. Like, he's mm. bad at it. He's He expresses his points Orly. He's like a tinfoil hat Alex Jones fucking cons- conspirator. He, he screen caps people's profiles with their name and everything and tweets it out to his like 600,000 followers. Like, it's it's really shitty. And he won't back down. No. At all. Um. So anyway, things escalate and a... <sighs> the National Lottery in the UK dedicated donates is set to donate a portion of money to mermaids which is a charity for um like young people with gender dysphoria and like you know a lot a lot of what they do is just outreach information and support that's it yeah like if you go to the website it's mainly a hub for resource yeah like you can click on it's like if you're a parent of a transgender child or like you know if you're like trans and over 18 click on this link like it's basically a hub getting information out there and like providing support for things that do go into and like um so i think that's a really needed thing because i think especially with trans people like there is not information out there like there's just not um Someone, a, someone, so a, a, basically someone who's like close to me, part of my extended family is trans, and like I've watched them go through every step of that, and it was really painful and confusing for them and also their family, which compounds to make the problem worse. Not because like being trans was any great horrific thing, but like because just the information wasn't out there. These people didn't have context, and they had to go through a lot of that when a lot of that stuff wasn't out there. So I think this stuff is really important. It's important people do have the resources and, you know, people will make arguments. Like, the main criticism towards mermaids is people will be like, oh, they're gonna, I don't know, trick people into turning trans. I don't quite understand the argument people try and make and for And feed it. undecided children drugs that yeah. will yeah. alter them. That is completely not what they do. And I don't want to get... I don't even get to the medicine because I, I did end up kind of looking up a lot of this. I don't want to get into it too specifically, but like that is not what they do. And that is also not quite how the medicine works. The idea that they just stop that stuff. From 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 any trans people I know, they are the most patient and they have contemplated and really, you know, it, it's such a serious thing. Yeah. It's, and like, it's not a it's not a fucking ridiculous situation it's 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 serious yeah no one should be forced to live the gender that they don't feel as them obviously but i think that's why mermaids and charities like them are important you know but anyway graham lenahan campaigns and he gets this he makes a post on mom's net and kind of like whips up a conservative mom storm yeah conservative mom storm of conspiracy theory levels yeah like garbage yeah and um which is really dark it's like it's troubling to see one of the most troubled and least understood parts of society just get the shit kicked out of them like that enter our buddy h bomber guy and he starts a donkey kong live stream where he's gonna play donkey kong 64 to 101 percent completion mm-hmm. and 
it takes them, I think, 56 hours, somewhere there? 57 hours. 57 hours. And, and his first goal is just to do $4,000. Yeah. And I got a message from someone, I think, Thursday evening, being like, he's raised $30,000. And I was like, holy shit. Dude goes on to make close to $340,000 for charity, which is, like, it's so great, and it is probably some of the best comeuppance I have ever seen anyone get. Well, it's a charity a lot of us didn't know about until Graham Linehan pointed it out. And mm -hmm. now they're getting hundreds of thousands of dollars in funding. An ungodly amount of like marketing and publicity all because this stupid bigoted motherfucker ran his mouth. Yeah, but um, the stream was really lovely as well. Like yeah. it, was, it was real. It was fascinating. Like I jumped in um, or when Jim Sterling tweeted it out and I was like, oh cool. So I dropped in and it was at 50k. And I was like, okay. Then next time I dropped in it was a hundred, then it was 150, then it was two hundred, and they were getting Mara Wilson and like just every lefty YouTuber you could imagine was on it. Loads of like trans creators talking about stuff. It was just like every time you hopped on, there was something fascinating happening. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. really, really a nice moment in gaming overall as I well. It was just like a really hopeful start to the year yeah yeah like, like 2018 a... got pretty bleak this was awesome that was uh, yeah like that was fucking awesome have you guys played donkey kong 64 i beat it i never beat it as a kid it is so hard it is one of the most frustrating multitask fucking like because you play five main characters but there are collectibles that are only like but like they're grayed out to other characters you can only collect them as those characters. So, like the amount of backtracking and like, like bear in mind mental note saving that you need to do to 101% complete the game. Like the amount of frustration that is required to play that game. Why did he pick this game? <laughs> because, like, I, 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 I think to me, like Brian, he played it as a child and he yeah, beat it. But like, I think to an adolescent who thinks they're who, who who feels they're trans like that frustration must be even like 100 times more oh yeah i think i think being trans is probably harder than donkey kong 64 <laughs> <laughs> well, i just think he's like i mean who knows <laughs> I, I just think it, it it was it was thematically to, relevant thematically in terms of frustration and just overcoming i just think it it, it has this nice catharsis um Okay, and that is going to bring us to emails. Neve. Yes. You had some emails for us. Shit. <laughs> no, I, I do. Uh. I feel like we're we're every week we're we're smoothing out the kinks with the email section. Okay, okay. <laughs> we have an email address. It's called ask let's fight a boss at gmail dot com. That's ask let's fight a boss at gmail dot com. You have to put that bit in, otherwise it won't send. Do not email let's fight a boss at gmail dot com or let's fight a boss at gmail dot com. Make sure you email ask, ask let's, let's fight, fight a boss. boss. We made that clarification last week. We got way more emails this week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, please keep up. Uh, we do read all your emails. Uh, we love you all. You're cool. Yeah, absolutely. I wish, I wish we got to read more because fucking so many go unread. But we do absolutely read them all. This is from Flyby. Hey, Bosscast. Recent L Faber, and I have a few questions about figure collecting as I've recently started my own collection. When did you guys start your figure collection, and what was uh, the first you bought with your own money? What do other things uh, think of you collecting figures? Luckily, my friends are also collectors and we all appreciate a good figure. My parents are fine with it as well. Finally, what is your favorite kind of figure, i.e. posable, static, etc. And what is the favorite one you own? Thank you guys for the podcast. Okay, well, step one, stop collecting anime figures. No, come on. Boxy's cool. Boxy's got a good question. So when did you guys first start collecting? Um, I think the first one, the first, like, okay, if we're not counting, like, garbage figures, the first one that I bought that I put, like, proper money into, I think I got when I was about maybe 18 years old, as in, like, a proper scale figure made by, like, a Japanese company that's meant to be displayed on the shelf, 
and it was a Majin Vegeta figure. And he had his kind of it's 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 a really nice figure and it's really hard to find good Vegeta figures. There's actually fuck all of them and it's really frustrating. Yeah, I got you a Vegeta toy. You, you got me one of the two nice Vegeta toys. <laughs> yeah, I still I still have that on display. It's like center shelf. Yes. Um and I really like that figure. Looking back now, the paint job on it wasn't great. It looked like a 3D version of the Dodge tool in Photoshop. Figures have come a long way. They have come like, a long way. Even the last three years. Yeah. There was a point about three years ago where I was like, man, facial sculpts on on trigger on figures have gotten so much better. Uh, my first anime figure was one of the original Nendroids. I got this in 2007. What number is it? I think it's number 17. That's so crazy, isn't it? The first batch of Nendroids are all Saber from the Fate Stay whatever you call series. This was L from Death Note, and it's an official like Nendroid made by Good Smile. I don't, I, I don't even think it's. I, I think it says Good Smile on it, but this is this is from over a decade ago, and it looks like a bootleg now. He's just like a solid mass, isn't he? Yeah, he has a, a standing up body and a sitting down body, and he has a bunch of different faces. The hair is really, really, really well sculpted, uh, but he kind of looks. I, I, I'm, I like. I, I did have him out like near a window, so I think he has a bit of sun damage. But he's my first Nendroid, and I still have the box and everything. What about you, Eve? I've been collecting stuff and figures for so long that it's kind of hard to know where to make that separation. The first things I used to collect, the ones that I would buy with my own my own money, was Beast Wars, the posable uh, figures that could. You know, they're a robot. They're part of the Transformers okay. line. Let me ask you a question. Okay. When is the first time you had that feeling where you're like, I spent too much money on this? Is the answer never, Neve? Never. <laughs> Again, I like this a lot. I guess the time, like, I collect posables rather than scales, though, so I don't really have that first scale I bought kind of thing. But I guess the first line I really was like, I am going to start buying this was um, Play Arts Kai and the Final Fantasy figures and I bought an Orin and oh I actually have an X2 Yuna scale that I got when I was a teenager that I really liked. Do you guys have any uh, Todd McFarlane toys? Yes I had spawns. Yeah. I had because they because I, I I like you know like back in the 2000s that that was a kind of I had a they were the of figures them. you would and collect I had, yeah. Um, I had I had I had a I think I had no I didn't have any spawn I had some of his fairy tale stuff yeah they were fucking cool grim nightmare yeah things. and then I had just like some kind of random monster ones he made as well that were really cool that they, they were they were awesome like I'd actually I'd love a shelf of them I had a Freddy Krueger one as well and my mom recently found it and has it on her shelf in the kitchen along with a whole pile of mom tat like so like a gold Buddha next to Freddy Krueger <laughs> I was like this is such a white mom shelf your mom is way. so cool yeah. that's really cool she's like oh, i thought he was nice with his hat <laughs> um, i think man. i think i prefer scale figures just because i i feel like the poses you get from scale figures are always so much stronger than whatever you can do with a posable figure that's someone who doesn't know anything about posable figures yeah. you can get some really good posable figures not as good as a perfect poses and they are absolutely they're never perfect they have oh my Neve. super action statue the jojo line those poses are clean and pretty the sh figure art um, dragon ball line they are nice you can get some really clean you looking can get poses. some really nice poses that do not look anywhere near as good as a scale figure Maybe you like how posables look, but if you want to say you can get the same level of quality out of like a piece of like plastic that is 100% sculpted for this one pose, Neve, that's insane. Well, you can get a nice pose, but then the other one can have a nice sculpt and you can get multiple poses out of them. Here's the thing, I want to put a figure in a cabinet and I never want to think about it again. I want to look at its nice pose and I want to be like... Yeah. Oh, for me, I like to change the pose every year. I love posable figures. I have a bunch of figments and I'll change like where they are and who they're interacting with because I have like mm -hmm. a diorama yeah, in my no, figure cabinet. I just want them to be perfect forever. So, okay, what was the first one you bought with your own money? I think we answered that, mm -hmm. did we? Yeah, yeah pretty much. Uh, what, do you, what do others think of you collecting figures? They all support it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um... Sometimes Michelle will bring home friends from the normal world mm. and they will see my figures and be like, 
Huh. It's kind of the same with with my girlfriend Rebecca's family. She's they're kind of like, oh yeah, I forgot you. Because really like your toys. Yeah. And you, you know you know when you get maintenance done in your apartment and the the guy comes in and he's like. <laughs> what the fuck is this? So one time, yeah. one time, one time, me and Brian live in the same apartment block, and one time a maintenance guy came into my apartment and he was like, "There's another apartment like this." <laughs> um, uh, you got some anime bullshit in this my apartment. My brother was in my house and he was just like, "When Dad comes up, you need to hide those because <laughs> he oh, just thinks Jesus. my dad hates them." He was just like, "They're a waste of money," and he would say stuff like. Will you eat plastic when you're starving? <laughs> but d- see, see, <laughs> no, like, you'd fucking no. go out into the wasteland and hawk your amazing anime figures for maximum profit. See, my dad used to uh, like collect and build model airplanes, so mm. I can't like, I like he's got no ammunition against me. And my girlfriend also collects figures as well, so we're pretty good there. Michelle never cared about figures until we went to Japan. And the first day in Akihabara, she went mental for figures. She got so into it. I and love it was, her new Scully. It was it's so good. Yeah. So good. That was a Christmas present. Um, Michelle has a a Barbie Scully from X Files. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, what is your favorite kind of figure? Posable or static? Posable. Posable. I'm cool. So static. <laughs> um. I have a few statics as well, but I would just prefer posable. And what is the favorite one you own? Uh, I'll go first. Yeah. Mine is my Frankie GX63. That's rad. Uh, it's a transformable Frankie mech. That is Frankie's mech from One Piece uh, post time skip. And you open it up and there's a little Frankie in the mech. But then it can also transform into a tank and a motorcycle. <laughs> It's ridiculous, and it's made out of diecast metal. It is incredibly heavy, and it has a katana. What about you? Um, ooh, it's hard to pick. I really like my Super Action Statue JoJo collection. Um, Which one though, Gappy? I really love the Part Two guys and the Pillar Men specifically. They're really oh, yeah. they're really nice figures. The boxes they come in are fucking huge as well. Yeah. Um, but I think my favorite is. I have a reissue of the Godzilla on trike uh, yes. <laughs> Bullmark uh, vinyl toy. So this originally came out in 1969 and this is a reissue from 2006 and I love that. It's a little, he's on a wind-up trike. That's, yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. That's got a little spiral pattern on the mm-hmm. side of the wheels. It's super cute. Um, other than that, I have a limited edition uh, real action hero, Tiger Joe. And it's it's from a really old Japanese um, is Tokusatsu series, Tokusatsu uh, television series called Line Maru, and I love it. It's just a man in a lion suit, <laughs> and I have a hot toy of Anakin Skywalker, and I also love that. Is Tiger Mask your rarest figure? It's not Tiger Mask. It's Tiger Joe. Tiger Joe. Sorry. 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 I'd Joe. say Tiger Joe probably is my rarest one. Because my rarest figure isn't even on display. What is your rarest one? It's a fierce deity link from first four figures, and they only made like a thousand of them. Ooh. I bought it ten years ago, and it's just. It's Why did I have it on display? Because it looks like shit. Fair enough, <laughs> but it's worth a lot. Yep, goes up in value every year, and it's in a fucking cupboard. Um, my favorite figures, I think my proper proper one would be um, I have. I can. I always fuck up with It's like Momohime from Muramasa and the Demon Blade. That's uh, one of the two protagonists of that game, and I like that game a lot. But I, what I always loved about that game was the aesthetic. I loved the character designs and Vanillaware are really fucking good. Yeah, and this figure just captures that look like a hundred percent. But it was also it was my big stupid purchase from Japan. Like I spent way too much money on it. Yeah, you got it. And I'm really happy I did. It actually went up in value a lot after I bought it, but then they eventually did a reprint, and so it went down in value. Um, That's always the way. Other figures that I really, really love as well. Um, I love my Sonade from Naruto. It's just, it's just a really cute figure, and the pose is really cool. And I love my Killer Queen Super Action Statue. I love my Yoshikage Kira 
um, scale that was present from you and Rebecca and Eve. And I really love my Jolene as well. Michelle recently got me a Jolene figure and I, I just love it. Figures are fun. Yeah. Yeah, have fun. What else we got? Uh, okay, I'll read this one. This is from Cameron and it's about talent versus skill. Hi, let's fella boss. I was wondering when you were younger and learned and learned you wanted to be animators, uh, were you good at drawing already? Uh, did you have natural talent? I've always loved art and being creative, but I am horrible at drawing. Just wondering if you went to art school and learned more techniques and had more practice to hone your skills, or was it something you came into school already pretty good at? Uh, uh, I was going to go to school for video game art, and I felt I did not have the raw skill set to be there. Just wondering, thanks. Sorry for the horrible grammar. Look. I apologize for my horrible reading out. It's it's it's, it's me. No one ever has to apologize for grammar, spelling, or not knowing English. It's fine. Do you know, do you know one thing I notice? Do yeah. you ever notice that the people who always apologize for writing long emails are never the people that actually write the real long emails? No. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, the fucking narcissists out there. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> um. Don't send us those emails because you know who you are, and we and no. I don't mind a good long email if it's good. Yeah, as long as they apologize at the end. I need someone to do in the bathroom. Yeah. Look, fuck, are we going to be real? That's where I read most of the emails. Yeah, um, I, I've, I've done that a few times. I read them in bed with a cup of tea. God, you're so Irish. Yeah, god damn it. Well, it's Checking better than reading while bed. pooping. Why? <laughs> Who do you want reading your email, me or John? <laughs> they probably prefer you even with the toilet stuff. <laughs> so, um, talent versus skill. Like, okay. like John, are you pushing while you're reading? No. I, oh my god. Anyway. <laughs> what are you doing? Are you just sitting there appreciating the I'm, smell? I'm recovering and I'm waiting <laughs> until my body is ready to. It, look, it doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't you, matter. I'm not having this conversation. Are you waiting for what opened to, to close? Talent versus skill. Oh my god. We we fucking lost at this episode. And I know I say that every second episode, but this episode, this is too much. This is, I think it's just the right amount. Talents, skill. Um, this is a weird one because I think I used to have a very set view on talent versus skill. And like, you know, talent is something you're inherently born with. Skill is something that you can learn. Um, I used to always tell myself that like talent isn't important. All that matters is skill. All that matters is hard work. And that is true up to a point. I think if you wants to be an animator if you want to get into animation even if you don't have a lot of talent in it i think you can work hard and you can get there and um, i definitely did that like i was not a strong drafts person at all going into college i'm still not really uh, brian you were kind of similar yeah neither of us had like a lot of talent in regards like drawing things or using a pencil and we both improved immensely throughout college but we also both got into jobs that didn't involve drawing as well. Yeah, I, I I don't hold a stylus to draw. I use a mouse. Yeah. And so I think, you know, if you want to pursue... Like, if you want to go to animation college... He wants to do game development. Game development. Same thing. You don't... It's the same thing, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, Like, a lack of drawing should never hold you back from what you want to do. I think where the line is, though, is that the most talented people in like the most kind of the most like up there positions in like whether it be like game design illustration comic books anything like that those are usually people born with an immense amount of talent and i have a lot of trouble discerning the difference between someone who has a lot of talent and someone who's just been drawing from a very young age I think, you see, this is the problem I have with this. I would probably be someone who's considered, and generally, as I was growing up, as someone who was talented with art. Yeah. Neve's an incredible drafts person. We've said this before. Um, And I think sometimes when people talk about talent, talent gets you so far. Talent will get you to college. Then you have to hone your craft, you know? So 
talent got me to a place where I understood my limitations and then I had to study, you know? So I think when people talk about talent, sometimes it downplays the hard work that a talented person has to put into things. Like, yeah. I didn't come out of the womb knowing perspective. I read a book, you know what I mean? Totally. But then I can use my talent, but also my talent that I can use for drawing is also like a ta you know is a talent in a different area like you know cooking or whatever you know what i mean it's it's an i think it's an intense interest that you can yeah back i think up part of it is like part of the talent is you're very interested in it and you enjoy it so just the act of drawing is pleasurable and so you do it from a much younger age like with me i don't think drawing was ever that pleasurable until i became interested in media that made me interested in it and then i kind of worked backwards from there mm and because i'd never developed that and like i think you're right Eve, like hard work is incredibly important but i think also if you take two people one of them who has been drawing their whole life or you know one of them who was born with a lot of talent drawing their whole life and then like someone who doesn't have much experience with it they can put in the same level of work over the same 10 years but one will be like polishing a diamond and one won't you know yeah um... yeah my kind of thoughts on it are that like you could be super naturally talented and I know really 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 talented animators but there's skills outside of just the art side like you have to be like super diplomatic sometimes um, being a reasonable person to work with like I know people that they might not be good at art but they have a critical eye but they're also very good at communicating oh yeah I mean like outside of just like the pure just like in terms of professional like whether you're cool like whether you're easy to work with whether you're open to communication whether that is so much of the job yeah, being a and, team player is way more yeah. important yeah absolutely so I, I i think um there's the portfolio element of it that that me and john are both talking about that, that that'll get you so far but there's just there like the skills in the long term are way more important yeah um but what i would say like as well I think it's good if, if you don't have a lot of talents, you know, it's a long, long road to becoming like a professional illustrator on any degree, whether it's like an animator or whatever else like that. That's a difficult path. But if you just like drawing and if you just want to improve and you're not concerned with making a career out of it, that's fine, too. And like that's something that like I struggled with for a really long time. And I kind of learned eventually that just drawing for drawing's sake is enough and you don't need to be, you never need to be as good as the amazing people because like you probably, you're not meant for that. Like you're probably good at other things. And I think the things that will ultimately get you the furthest are the things that you're naturally good at, you know? Because mm. like I spent a lot of my life kind of mainly just drawing, but then, you know, when I took up video making, I had a lot more ability in that than I ever did in drawing. And it's weird because that is something that I didn't do as a child. It is something that I just picked up and I could do it. I think with that, when you're young, you're given a paper and a pencil and you start drawing and you're like, okay, I'm creative. What do I do as a creative job? And you want to do something in games people don't know what jobs there is like you can be a level designer if you like levels you know you can be a gameplay designer you can be a writer you can be a map painter you can be an environmental designer you can be a character designer you can be a character rigger you can be a character animator there's so many different parts that go into animation and game development that has nothing to do with the physical act of drawing yeah so like i think look at the things you like as well and look at the kind of jobs that are out there like like comping like editing like there's so many things that can be you can be creative at that doesn't you know you can work up a skill at and doesn't require just raw talent you know yeah totally i think people I, it'd be great if the process of making games is a bit more demystified for people so they could kind of focus on things think, that they might actually be good there. at. I think yeah, in the next totally. 10 years you're going to see a lot of programs and software aimed at breaking down the fundamentals of game development mm -hmm. to a much wider audience. I think that's super exciting. Yeah, I really like with Spider-Verse how open they were with all their resources yeah. and what they did, like sharing the script for like people who wanted to write scripts and stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I read most of that script and it was so interesting to see visualizing your mind with just text yeah um yeah i know i i i do think um like i i, I think even with this podcast like there, there there's an element of being creative 
having to work with it but it's not something any of us planned out to do mm. but it's something that I guess being as animators you kind of have to think on the spot you've got to kind of come up with something real quick I think doing a podcast is a lot like improv yeah and I'm sure when people do their first day of improv they probably suck at it much the same way we probably sucked when we started out doing the podcast yeah, those first 30 episodes wherever they are long gone <laughs> um and I definitely like I definitely think there was a huge learning process to the podcast like not even just the technological side but just how to interact with each other and like I always say it but whenever I'm on a different podcast it's always very strange not having Brian and Eve there because we kind of learned how to do this together yeah I think skill is like it's really important to develop skill but you shouldn't beat yourself up for not having talent I think that's the that'd be the no it end I'd leave that on yeah you guys I think talent can make people complacent as well I think a lot of people are used to being the best artist in the room and then they go into a different room like art college and then there's a load of a load of other people who are used to being the best artist in the room and they don't then work on their craft and I think it's important if you are a person to ta with talent to never stop striving to learn to improve it you know what I mean yeah 100% Cameron, you got this. We believe in you. Good luck, Cameron. Can we take one more? Yeah, this is our last one. Neve, do you want to take this one? Yeah. So this is an anonymous um, email. Hello, your podcast is one of my favorites for the past two years or so that I've been listening. One of my favorite aspects of it has become the semi-regular life advice talks that occur time to time, and I was hoping to ask for some life advice myself. I'm currently a student um, in college working on a bachelor's degree, while still being financially dependent on my parents. This wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for the sac uh, fact that they are extremely conservative and Catholic, like Alex jo Jones level conservative, and I'm closeted gay and trans. As a result, I have to delay becoming who I truly am for the next couple of years until I finish the degree or risk losing my financial safety net. This has caused me a lot of stress, and I'd like to know if you have any advice on how I can express myself in an environment where doing so is potentially dangerous. I spend the majority of my time living on campus at college and the only return and only return home on breaks. However, the university is STEM focused and the majority of the student population leans conservatively. Um, conservatively. I'd like to join the LGBT focus group at my college, but I'm worried that doing so might leave me ostracized by many at school or worse lead to my family finding out about my secret. Thanks in advance for taking the time to read this. Once again, I love the podcast. It's become a uh, part of my routine and I genu genuinely look forward to. The positivity and acceptance to our LGBT issues on the podcast is also genuinely refresh refreshing in comparison to the rest of nerd culture. I think you should uh, maybe let me and Brian take this one, Neve. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly, <laughs> certainly me by the sound. <laughs> <laughs> the experts. Yeah. Um, uh, first up, don't worry about coming out. Coming out does not affect your identity. You know who you are, and coming out doesn't make change that loads of people come out at totally different stages in life and the most important thing is that you're safe so you know it's not safe for you right now um which is good that you've identified that because um it can be really dangerous um so first off yeah it, always remember it doesn't being out does not make you who you are gay or trans you know what i mean uh second there is some stuff you can do um, you mentioned your LGBT group. If they're a good LGBT group in college, you could probably email the leader of them and say, I cannot do on-campus activities with you because I'm afraid of being outed and being outed, you know, could damage me. And they will understand that. You could maybe do off-campus stuff that your friends don't need to know about. And most LGBT groups will allow for this and be okay with this. Uh, so maybe maybe think about doing that that might be something if you feel comfortable and you want to like maybe they do coffee dates maybe they do movie dates maybe they go out drinking i don't know what their social life is but maybe you could do that stuff and it'll be away from campus grounds and you'll feel a bit safer and comfortable doing it um other options there are it's really hard when you can't be who you are there is kind of things I find like, is there a totem that kind of means something to you and something to your identity? Like, and like, just like a character in a game, you know, that you feel comfortable with or you associate with. Something that wouldn't be, you know, pegged by someone else 
as gay you know what i mean so like as lgbt people we're used to living in the margins we're used to doing things to protect our safety and we're used to clocking things when they aren't safe so if you can kind of maybe identify an object for yourself a necklace a t-shirt even just a character or something i would keep something like that with me you know just because it'll be a little keepsake for me for so i could focus on it and just be kind of a little reaffirming for yourself and your identity like just anything small like like you can't wear a rainbow pin but maybe you can have a chloe price pin you know what i mean like no one has to know the connection the connection is important to you and you alone um other than that if you can feel safe doing online things like listening to lgbt podcasts that can make you feel less alone or if there's discord groups um joining them would be a good idea and just being able to talk about it because the experience of being closeted and being forced closeted because you can't come out is 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 draining like it really is and i feel really i feel bad for you like it's it's a hard time but again doesn't affect your identity doesn't affect who you are take it day by day and hopefully hopefully things will be a little easier for you some very well said Neil. that's some damn good advice yeah i think anon best of luck yeah for this person you. but I'm, I'm sure there's others out there listening and like they, they 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 probably super relate to that yeah just like again i always want to reiterate if you do not feel safe coming out there is no rush i met a 70 year old woman at a gay bar once and it was her first time out on the scene and she had a little butterfly uh, tattoo on her shoulder and she showed it to me and she was just like i've kept this on my shoulder for years and it was the only um thing that's known i was gay and like it was a thing where her husband who she truly loved had passed away because she was like married into it like uh she was married because you know she couldn't be gay at that time and she was just like and he told me like the thing he wanted me to do was go out there and live my gay life so it was her and her butterfly and she knew you know jesus i know it was one of those moments i was just like that must have hit you hard <laughs> yeah i was just like i'm <laughs> like i'm in my tank top with my with my stupid lesbian haircut and i have this like little gay old lady who's just like loves being here and loves the scene and it's just you know you can come out at any age there's no rush the community is there for you in or out of the closet yeah you know feels like a good time to say that's why the boss has always been and will always be for everyone yeah oh yeah and with that we're going to move into our patreon shoutouts brian yeah someone wants to contribute to the world's strongest patreon where do they go they go to patreon.com forward slash l f a b b where do they go Patreon forward slash LFA. Jesus Christ! What is that wrong? Fucking money down the drain. Money down the <laughs> Wait, drain. Wait, Patreon.com? Yeah. Well, I think they'd know the dot com. I put trust in them. It's LFAB. <laughs> so, I if really... you can dig it out of that broken ass collection of fucking words, it's Patreon.com forward slash LFAB. And we got. LFAB. LFAB. <laughs> um, we have. Three, and if you do that on our Discord, we have a shout out section. So if you would like a little message read out of the podcast, you can go there. So, Neve, why don't you start us off here? This is from Cosmic. Hey, Pinky and the Brain and Snowball the Hamster, just want to throw a shout out to the listening crew. Believe in me, in me that believes in you. Never give up on your dreams. Thank you, Cosmic. I'm going to take this next one from Paper Mache. Josh, Brain, and Milk Girl are my favorite co-workers and the only people at my job I will partake in conversation with. Yeah. <laughs> right on, paper mache. And then this last one is from Neon Love. Uh, a friend of mine came to me the other day and said, never get high and listen to John and Brian talk about Backy the Grappler. Do you know, that's just good life advice. Yeah, just don't do that. No, I don't do that at all. Um, guys, it's time for the final section of our podcast it is the loot drop Neve, what do you got mine is the monster podcast uh this is season two and it's about the zodiac killer 
and it is an exploration into the Zodiac Killer. And I thought I pretty much knew this case because like, it's a classic. Um, this goes into so much detail. Interviews with the people who were there at the time, like um, radio, radio recordings, uh, police recordings. It's like readings of the letters. Uh, and it also focuses a lot just on the fear of the people around in the area, which I, again it's always so from the Zodiac killer's perspective, despite us not knowing who he was, that I found it very interesting to see how communities kind of felt and how their lives changed. This is season two of Monster. Season one is also really good. And it's about the uh, Atlanta child murders. And again, it's a very in-depth look at these cases. Um, And they're quite, they're really interesting. Cool. Good stuff. Brian, what do you got for us? I got two loot drops. I got one from Superforge on YouTube, the history and evolution of Hollow Knight. Uh, Hollow Knight goes way back further than I thought it did. It actually comes from a game jam. Whoa. Yeah, and they always had that protagonist in the game. I remember being on NeoGAF and someone being like, oh, my friend's making a game called Hollow Knight. Check out the screens. And I looked at it and I'm like, yeah, this looks all right. Yeah, uh, it's, it was, I think the core team is like three friends in Australia. I think that's the Team Cherry is what they're called. Uh, it's a really, really, really good video. It's just cool because... As uh, you know, uh, I I I think if you're into games, maybe check out game jams. Maybe who knows what'll happen? You might end up making a game someday. Uh, then the other one is Good Blood on YouTube, Ocarina of Time, a masterclass in subtext. Did you guys watch this? Yep. What do you think? Uh yeah, good. I I really enjoyed this. This is a game I I want to replay this year, and this is an interesting video game analysis because it doesn't do the synopsis route at all. It's just like. It's someone's interpretation of Ocarina of Time. I don't agree with everything in it, yeah. but it, uh, the the person brings up some really really interesting points about like Shinto religion. Um, uh, Satchel Drakes is in this one. That's Satchbag. Yeah, and he's an old school video essayist. Kind of, he's been doing YouTube video essays kind of for a long time. Cool yeah, guy. Uh, I was really really impressed with the production value. I think it took like almost a year to make this video. Oh, it's a beautifully made video, and like it's cool because like. They're using the N64 graphics, but they're capturing it in HD. But, like, it just has this weird, like, just low-poly characters, but they're just trying to tell, like, they're really, really, really trying to, like, push their argument. But they they just use, like, the little low-poly models. I kind of like that. But, but, but they have, like, a mist all around it, and it really, really kind of, like, like it, it, it does grab your attention. I, I thought this was a great video. Yeah. Um. Okay. I got one from a channel I have really, really been enjoying lately, um, Jack Saint or Lacking Saint. And it's a video called Long Critique is Not Deep Critique. And this is a kind of specific video about, I guess, some of the trends that have been kind of developing in YouTube video essays. And maybe it's a little weird to recommend that because that, that's what I do, but... It's basically about how there is a lot of channels nowadays that are starting to pride themselves on, I guess, video length as opposed to what they're actually saying. And a lot of these channels will... A lot of it's just a summary of the work. It's padding. Yeah. and Like, just a Wikipedia summary of the work, kind of, with kind of criticism or analysis kind of thrown in. And I think it can work in some cases, but it's overwhelmingly... It's, it's becoming like I'm seeing it a lot more. I really don't think it's a very interesting avenue for video essays to take. And especially when it gets coupled with this idea of objectivity. And I'm kind of fucking blue in the face arguing objectivity versus subjectivity. And I have no interest in rehashing my arguments. And I don't think my arguments are <laughs> really going to make a difference. But... um. This was a really good video about the subject. I should say that the subject of this video is another YouTuber called Mauler. I had never heard of Mauler before this video. I don't have anything personally against them. Um, I think the arguments being made against our kind of videos are valid. And I think, um, you know, some of it's very telling as to the mindset of what it is to make videos like the way he does. But um, I won't get too into it. Just experience it for yourself. It's really good. And I'd also recommend just checking out the rest of Lacking Saints channel. Really good dude. Really great videos. His video on um, 90s cartoons as well was fantastic. And he's... I'm really looking forward to seeing how this guy evolves. Really good stuff. 
I'm exhausted. Let's end this podcast. I don't know. I think we could just... No, I, guys, there's been so many fucking sections of this podcast that I'm really... I, I'm just bothered by... I'm irritated right now. Do you think we could do a bit more Queen stuff? No, absolutely not. I hereby end this podcast... miles we walk The many things we learn The building of a shrine Only just to burn That's the way That's the way it is That's the way